Do you guys remember the MCU? After the successful release of the fantastic Iron Man, Marvel hit a hot streak building out a universe of beloved characters, many of whom would become the definitive versions of them in the public zeitgeist. For better and for ill. Is that like a personal attack or something? Still, the MCU told consistently solid stories that fit within a well-built-up world. It took over pop culture in the 2010s, becoming one of the most successful franchises to ever exist, with one of the highest grossing movies of all time. Too bad it ended after Avengers Endgame. Okay, obviously I'm being a bit cheeky. Ever since 2019, it seems that the MCU has been on a decline both in quality and reputation. Hardly anyone cares about it anymore. I mean, the last MCU thing that I've personally seen was Shang-Chi, and that's only because I was out of town with nothing better to do. From what I've heard, there are some diamonds in the rough, but the overall consensus of the current MCU has been less than stellar to say the least. It's in these times of crisis that we often turn to better times to find comfort in nostalgia. And so today we're going to pull a Jerry Reed and talk about the good times. And not just the good times, but the best of times. We're going to talk about Daredevil. Matt Murdock was created by Stan Lee and Bill Everett and debuted in his own self-titled magazine in April 1964, going on to become one of Marvel's most successful characters. However, unlike many of his contemporaries, he did not fare that well outside the pages of the comics. There were three different failed attempts to give him his own TV show, but he did finally get a movie. Let's just say it didn't work out too well for him. When his film rights lapsed back to Marvel, they finally had an opportunity to make a proper adaptation of this character. This effort was spearheaded by Drew Goddard, who has quite the repertoire of work under his belt. Dude wrote a handful of episodes of the final seasons of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, and Alias, the first four seasons of Lost, The Martian, and Cloverfield, as well as writing, directing, Cabin in the Woods, and Bad Times at the El Royale. I mean, he also wrote World War Z, but we're just gonna ignore that. Goddard originally pitched an R-rated Daredevil movie to Marvel, but it was rejected because it didn't fit the brand. Kevin Feige had plans to incorporate the character into the blockbuster action on the big screen, but the higher-ups at Marvel Entertainment agreed with Goddard's vision for the character and ordered a mature Daredevil show that would be the start of a Marvel television universe that would be directly under their control. Hey, say what you will about those guys. They may be greedy, but sometimes they get things right, since this decision gave us arguably the best thing that ever came out of the MCU. This is a Daredevil retrospective. So Drew Goddard was originally going to be the showrunner for Daredevil, but he stepped away to direct the Sinister Six movie. Yeah, you already know how that worked out for him. His fellow Buffy and Angel writer Stephen DeKnight replaced him as showrunner for the season, and while it's noticeably grittier than the Buffyverse, season one of Daredevil bears some similarities. It effectively serves as the origin story for the Daredevil persona, adapting Frank Miller's Man Without Fear run, and it really doesn't waste any time. The show opens up with Matt as a kid getting blinded in a car accident. I'm immediately endeared to Matt as we learn this accident happened because he saved an old man from being hit by a chemical truck. He sacrificed his own vision to save a man's life. We flash forward to the present where Matt attends confession with Father Lantum. He reminisces on his father's boxing career, highlighting the reverence he holds for Mad Jack Murdock. I love this monologue and it provides a lot of great lines that define Matt's character. I'm not seeking penance for what I've done, Father. I'm not asking forgiveness for what I'm about to do. That line honestly goes so hard. I mean, it's not how confession works, but still, the line goes hard. So what is Matt about to do? He's going to go beat up some human traffickers. Okay, I think your priest might be fine with that. I mean, Saint Nicholas pimp slapped a hoe for much less. I love how this guy's just watching all this go down while snacking. Though it doesn't exempt him from justice. However, Matt goes berserk on one of the goons, named Turk Barrett, after he tries to shoot the fleeing girls. She used to say, be careful of the Murdoch boys. They got the devil in them. It seems like Matt wasn't just referring to his dad. This fight does a great job establishing Matt's basic powers and skills while displaying the darkness hidden deep within him. The next morning, Matt's friend Foggy Nelson goes to bribe police officer Brett Mahoney with cigars for his mother in exchange for a tip-off to any interesting legal cases. You see, Matt and Foggy are avocados at law, fresh out of school looking to start up a practice. However, they disagree on the approach to law. Matt wants to defend only those he deems as actually innocent, while Foggy is an equal opportunity defender. 
you know, because a, a law practice costs money. But it seems like Matt is going to get his way as, across town, a woman named Karen Page wakes up in a pool of blood just as the police arrive to arrest her. Brett passes the case on to Foggy, and the law boys show up to take care of business. These detectives seem suspiciously pissed off that their murder suspect is getting representation. Karen seems to be the clear culprit, and more importantly, she doesn't have any money. I'm out of here. However, Matt uses his enhanced senses to deduce that she isn't lying. I really like how this power is shown through an over-the-shoulder shot with the focus on the ear with the person he's listening to in the frame. It's a really simple way to communicate what he's doing, combining it with the sound design shifting focus to the heartbeat over the dialogue. Foggy wants to take a plea deal while Matt is intent on proving her innocence, causing Foggy to question his judgment. You don't necessarily show the best judgment when beautiful women are involved. How would I even know if she's a beautiful woman? I don't know. It's kind of spooky, actually. But if there's a stunning woman with questionable character in the room, Matt Murdock's gonna find her, and Foggy Nelson is gonna suffer. This establishes one of Matt's biggest weaknesses. Attractive women of ill repute. Don't worry, Matt, you're not alone there. <sighs> don't look at me like that. This is all I could afford, okay? I'm not poor, I swear! <laughs> oh, tastes like soggy bread. <laughs> For Matt, this is specifically Electra Nachos, who will go on to show up in Season 2. It's pretty cool to see a show lay groundwork for plot developments in later seasons, which Season 1 of Daredevil goes on to do multiple times. Meanwhile, a mysterious man named James Wesley blackmails a prison guard via threatening his daughter's life into Epstein and Karen. Like, for real, though. They even include cameras randomly going on the fritz. They do often say that life imitates art. Karen manages to ward off her attacker and survive. Matt and Foggy jump at this incident to push for her release. While the detectives from before are hesitant to appease them, they eventually do. I love how this small scene does a great job at differentiating these four characters. Matt approaches the situation from a very legalistic yet forceful disposition, while Foggy is snarky and antagonistic with the cops. On the detective side, Hoffman seems to be much more reasonable and reserved than his partner Blake, whom he has to convince to release Karen. Blake is a pretty aggressive guy, even going so far as to threaten Matt. Will you take that tone with me again? I don't care if you're blind. I'll kick the shit out of you. Dude's not doing a great job at hiding the fact he's the bad guy, is he? Karen goes free and spills the beans on why she's being targeted. She was a secretary for the financial head of the construction business Union Allied. One day, she received an email with a file called Pension Master, but it contained illegal transactions her boss was involved in. So, Karen invited the dead guy, Daniel Fisher, who worked in the legal department, out for drinks to tell him about the possible embezzling scheme. However, Karen was knocked out and woke up in his blood. She blames herself for his death and doesn't want any more deaths on her conscience. But, Matt and Foggy being the good guys that they are, insist on protecting her. Now, you may be wondering why Karen wasn't killed alongside Daniel Fisher, and instead the attempt on her life happened later. So is Matt. He deduces that Karen must still have the Pension Master file, but when he and Foggy showed up to defend her, plans changed to just Epsteining her to get the case to disappear. Karen lies to Matt about having the file and sneaks out that night to retrieve it. This is in line with her motivation to prevent Matt and Foggy's death as a result of her actions. However, Matt is still awake, and when she sneaks out, he follows her. Lucky he did, because the guy who is going to kill the prison guard's daughter, named Rance, ambushes Karen at her apartment. Don't know why he didn't just kill Karen right away, but it buys Matt enough time to burst in and fight the guy. The rumble with Rance is solid, but I do have one tiny issue. You know how Rance could easily win this fight? A gun. I get why Matt doesn't just use one. We learn that he's trained in martial arts and prefers that combat style. And I bet shooting guns frequently would be hell on a guy with super hearing. <laughs> However, Rance is a normal guy who is here to kill Karen and retrieve the Pension Master Drive. So why doesn't he have a gun? Unless we get the Rance Disney Plus show or something, I'm just going to assume that his brain is deficient. Maybe he's simple. And the thing is, we could have just added a line when Rance is introduced to the prison guard by Wesley where it's like, And Rance over here prefers to use knives over guns, so your daughter's death might be a little more 
painful than you would imagine. Or just something like that, I don't know. Matt tackles Rance out the window and he hits the ground so hard that it triggers a flashback where his father tries to force him to do his homework. Jack doesn't want Matt to grow up to be like him. Come on, Maddie. Get to work. I don't think he took the right lesson from that conversation. This harkens back to the line from Matt's confession. It never got knocked out, my dad. A knockdown, sure, but he uh, always got back up. Matt defeats Rance and drops him and the Pension Master drive off at the New York Bulletin. While this is going on, there's a meeting between perhaps the greatest group of secondary antagonists in TV history on a construction site just so happened to be owned by Union Allied. In one exchange, I got a really good feel for who every character is. Leland Owlsley is the group's financier. He complains about the cold weather, saying that he would rather meet at Per Se, which is a fancy restaurant in Manhattan from my very brief research. This shows him to be an elitist snob who's more comfortable behind a desk than in the field. This is reinforced by how he treats the others at the meeting. He looks down upon the Chechnyan brothers, viewing them as savages. I'll domesticate you boys yet. Nobu creeps him out with his stoicism, and he's put off by Madame Gao because she doesn't speak English. Nobu? The man is Japanese. I know, I know, I just thought that... Forget it. Hey, you know what, the Rankskov brothers may be child traffickers, but at least they ain't racist. Wesley arrives, which adds some more conflict into the group. Turns out the Rankskovs run the trafficking ring that Matt thwarted at the beginning of the show, and they don't appreciate being scolded about it by the boss's stooge, especially since Wesley himself made a mess of the Union Allied situation and negotiations with a guy named Prohaska. I also really like how Wesley nearly becomes aggressive from time to time while trying to be composed. It humanizes him a little bit. This scene also does a great job at justifying the show's existence within the scope of the MCU. In the aftermath of the Battle of New York, which has now been dubbed The Incident, creative name there guys, many buildings and businesses have been decimated allowing Union Allied, which is partially owned by this criminal conglomerate, to swoop in and take over rebuilding projects in Hell's Kitchen. This allowed the group's kingpin to accumulate the immense amount of wealth necessary to enact his plan. The incident also brought rent prices down, which is what allowed Matt and Foggy to buy their new office space. This show literally could not have happened if Loki did not invade New York and if the Avengers did not stop him. This implicitly connects Daredevil to the MCU, but it's allowed to be its own self-contained story. That's what the MCU used to be and what it should have continued to be in terms of world building having stories that build upon the implications of previous stories while still being allowed to be its own thing. The next day, the Union Allied controversy is published in the newspaper and Wesley moves to cover everything up. Karen's life is spared now that all the compromising information she has is out there, but Matt and Foggy are now in the eyes of Wesley's boss. Despite their win, there is still a greater war to fight. Karen's boss is killed, the prison guard's bail is paid and his body is found by his daughter, and Rance gets Epstein. I really like how we don't see how any of this happens, adding to the menace of this unseen threat. And so Matt returns to the gym where his father once trained to prepare for a war with this enemy. I like this not only because there's a reference to Carl Creel, aka the Absorbing Man who would appear in a major role in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and also foreshadowing the flashback plot for the next episode, but also because it casts Matt's war on crime in a tragic light. Jack didn't want his son to become a devil who spends his nights getting beaten to a pulp, so Matt went to school to become a lawyer. Yet, as we see as the show goes on, he becomes a devil anyway. We then get a montage of the mini-bosses for the season doing their thing. Leland is cooking the books. The ranks Skahov's kidnapping kids. Gao oversees her blind folks making heroin. And Nobu preparing some construction plans for a specific block of Hell's Kitchen. And Matt is going to go out and stop them. Holy crap, they fit a lot of story into this first episode, doing a great job introducing the main characters and secondary antagonist while building up the menace of the main villain. The rest of the season follows this same sort of structure, a lightly episodic format that feeds into the overall serialized story. For example, episode 2, Cutman, follows the aftermath of Matt's failed attempt to save the boy who was kidnapped by the Chechnyans. 
He's brutally stabbed and found in a dumpster by a nurse named Claire Temple. The main plot of the episode follows these two as they help each other out. Your outfit kind of sucks, by the way. I'm gonna have to disagree with you there, Claire. This is a very practical homemade suit. It's all black, which is useful for sneaking around at night like a ninja. Plus, the mask is very unique in that it covers his eyes, which looks very cool in its simplicity. Matt can afford it since he's blind, while all other superheroes need eye holes because they, they their eyes work. Eventually, Matt senses a man going door to door looking for him. He comes to Claire's door, introducing himself as NYPD Detective Foster. Claire convinces Matt to allow her to try a non-violent solution to this problem. Oh, he didn't believe you. Well, I guess it's Matt's turn to resolve this. Holy crap, Matt just killed that guy. Alright, I'm, I'm calling BS on that. That amount of blunt force trauma is definitely gonna kill a hoe. Anyway, Matt and Claire get the, at the very minimum, concussed Foster ready for some interrogation. As they prepare, Claire makes it known that Matt's brutality disturbs her. Why'd you help me, Claire? She explains that she treats people every day who have interacted with Matt, from the criminals he stops to the victims he's rescued. This has led her to believe in him and his mission. This is why I love her role in the episode. Claire is a random stranger who has seen the effects of Matt's war against crime, and it is inspiring hope among a fearful populace. Ironically, the devil within Matt is becoming a savior for those in need. This also coincides with what he tells Claire. You can't give in to the fear. If you do, men like this win. The man without fear is standing up to those who inspire it in others, and now it is inspiring others to stand with him. When Foster wakes, the two begin their interrogation. Matt uses his super hearing to determine whether or not the phony fuzz is lying. Here's where I'm going to have to interject and ask some questions. This power acts like a simplified lie detector, determining the truthfulness of someone's statement by listening to their heart rate. The issue is that this is an inconsistent methodology. You can easily calm yourself and lie without increasing your heart rate. Allow me to demonstrate. Game of Thrones had a good ending. Avengers Endgame is a great movie. I don't suffer from crippling loneliness that leaves me wondering if I'm ever going to- Okay, that got a little too personal. Plus, I just realized you guys couldn't actually see my heart rate, so you can't verify my claim. The, the point is, a person's heartbeat is not a reliable determinant of a lie. I'm surprised that Karen's heart rate wasn't all over the place earlier since she just got arrested for a murder she didn't commit. In her case, extraneous circumstances could have easily caused her heart rate to increase randomly, leading Matt to dismiss her claims and leaving her to rot in prison. In Foster's case, he's a hardened Russian criminal who doesn't care about the fate of this boy, so why would his heart rate spike only when he's lying in response to Matt's questions? This just operates like pop culture lie detectors. They are unbeatable even though it's pretty easy to beat them in real life. This is not legal advice. I, Spidgey, am not to be held accountable for if any of you people get arrested and try to beat a lie detector and do not beat it. This will just have to be a given fact that Matt's lie detection powers are flawless, so as long as it behaves consistently, I guess I'll give it a pass. Thanks to Claire's help, try stabbing me, try jamming on nerve. Matt is able to get some information out of Foster, but he has to imitate Batman Begins to get the last PC needs. Where were the other drugs going? Uh, 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 I never knew. I don't know. I swear to God. Swear to me! Well, I guess it was smart of Matt to get some information at least out of the guy before he killed him. He'll live. Oh, come on! Are you serious? What, is this guy in- Dude took a multi-storied fire extinguisher to the noggin, and then a tumble off the top of the same building, and he's still alive? What the hell? Hey, at least it's not as bad as John Wick 3. Anyway, Matt uses this intel to give us one of the best fight scenes in television history. This hallway scene is revered by basically everyone, and for good reason. I love the action in this show in general, but this fight scene is the show's action at its peak. I love how real it feels. 
Matt is going into the lion's den with a freshly stitched up stab wound and it begins to show as the fight wears on. Both Matt and his opponents start to tire out, ditching flashy fight moves for desperate punches to make sure their opponent just goes down. Another nice detail is how these goons don't go down in one hit. Matt has to knock them down multiple times before they're no longer a threat. I mean, this guy in particular gets knocked out and then later comes to toward the end of the fight, forcing Matt to fight him again. This feels like a rough fight for Matt, and the sheer punishment and exhaustion he's going through makes the ultimate payoff when he rescues the kid feel all the more satisfying. And this is basically how every fight scene this season goes down. Matt takes damage and sustains it, as does his enemies. You would not believe how rare that is in action shows and movies. One last detail that was great was when Matt takes off his mask to humanize himself to the kid. Very amazing Spider-Man of you, Matt. This episode also follows a complimentary B-plot where Foggy takes Karen out on the town. Karen has started working for Nelson and Murdoch as a secretary in order to repay them for handling her case. However, she's too afraid to return home, so Foggy takes her on a pub crawl that ends at a place called Josie's, which will become a regular meeting spot throughout the rest of the show. Here, Karen admits that she's too afraid to return to her apartment. You know, where her co-worker was murdered and Rance, the gunless man, tried to kill her. Everywhere she looks, she only sees the seedy darkness of Hell's Kitchen. But thankfully, Foggy is there to lift her spirits. He points out that everyone here seems like hardened criminals, but actually do a lot of good for the community. Except for that guy. That guy is... Whew, he's a creep. This is an excellent use of a character who for right now is serving as the comedic relief. He is there to show Karen that despite the seediness of Hell's Kitchen, there is still a light in the darkness. There is still value to be found even in a place as dark as this. This convinces Karen to enjoy the rest of the evening. The two march into the night with Foggy declaring, This city is beautiful. This ties the entire message of the episode together in a nice little bow. The city is seedy, but it's still beautiful. There's also a flashback plot in this episode that I absolutely adore. It follows Battle and Jack Murdoch as he struggles to be a good father for Matt. After Matt becomes blind, Jack prioritizes his son's education over anything, even going as far as to try to learn Braille to support him. However, his boss, the Fixer, forces him into a rigged match with Carl Creel so that he can provide for Matt. The Fixer wants Jack to throw the fight in the fifth round, but Matt overhears this exchange and develops doubts of his father. He asks for reassurance of the phrase Jack always told him. Can we get up? Right, Dad? This motivates Jack to make his son proud. Just once. I want Matty to hear people cheer for his old man. But first, he bets all of his money on himself and arranges for the winnings to be placed in an account under Matt's name, and he calls his baby mama Maggie, who will show up later in the show, asking her to be there for their son. He wins the fight and takes in the crowd's chance, knowing that Matt is home brimming with pride. He knows his fate, but he's fine with it, knowing that he made his son proud. His body is found later that night, shot by the Fixer's goons. I think Jack Murdock is a very underrated superhero parent. He's just a normal, down-on-his-luck guy trying to do right by his son, leading him to die for Matt's sake. I love his character, and it's probably the best part of this episode. The next episode follows Matt and Foggy as they defend a man named John Healy in court. What did he do to get there? All I wanted was to throw a few balls. Well, I guess he's kind of correct if you consider this guy's teeth as pins. This is one of my favorite cold opens of the show. John visits the bowling alley and approaches his victim. A one Mr. Prohaska takes out his guards and pulls a gun on him. A flashback reveals that John bought the gun from Turk, the trafficker from the beginning of the show, who assures him that the gun is perfect and will never jam on him. In the present, the gun jams, forcing John to bowl a strike in Prohaska's face. This gives us an excellent inciting incident for the episode that also pays off a small exchange between the Chechnins and Wesley earlier. It also is one of the most memorable deaths in the show that gives us a fun reference to John Healy's comic book counterpart, Alvin Healy aka Tinpin. Plus, the death just makes sense within the scene, as unlike Rance the Gunless Man, John actually tries to use a gun, but it jams, allowing for this uniquely brutal death. Wesley, wanting to get John off the charges quietly and avoid adding to the trail of bodies he's been leaving lately, hires Matt and Foggy, who are completely independent and clean, to represent him. 
In a character flip, this time Foggy's moral convictions make him uneasy about representing this clear monster while Matt pushes for the case in order to get closer to Wesley's employer. I really like this moment where Wesley breaks down the duo's short legal history. It's a nice natural way to introduce some exposition while also showcasing the sheer power Wesley's boss possesses to get all this information. Plus, the fact that Matt and Foggy rejected jobs from a big firm in Manhattan in order to start a small one in their backyard shows their altruistic motivation for getting into law, making them more likable protagonists. Healy's case seems easy enough. Prohaska's men have lawyered up, and the bowling receptionist lady only witnessed Healy's rampage in its aftermath. However, Matt detects one of the jurors' distressed heartbeats during Foggy's opening statements. He follows her that night and discovers that she's being blackmailed. He batters the blackmailer in an attempt to reach his boss, but this kingpin of crime has insulated himself too well. The next day, the juror is dismissed, and Matt proceeds with his closing statement. Holy crap, the murder trial wrapped in two days? I have never heard of that happening before. Can that actually happen? I mean, I know there's not a lot of preliminary evidence to go through, but still, two days? Anybody with legal knowledge, please, please let me know on that. Anyway, despite Matt's best efforts, he finds out that the jury is still rigged to ensure it came back hung, which frees John from prison. Matt takes advantage of this and jumps John that night. After another excellent fight scene, Matt manages to force him into giving up who his boss is. Fisk! Wilson Fisk! Oh no, didn't Wesley say? We don't say his name. Well, it turns out John remembers that rule, and he decides to kill himself for those he loves. This is what works so well about this episode. Previously, the show has built up the idea that the kingpin of crime has his influence in every nook and cranny of Hell's Kitchen. There's nowhere you can hide from him. That's already terrifying enough, but what this episode does effectively is building up the man's menace. We spend about 50 minutes with a hitman named John Healy who is a stone-cold MF'er. He's able to quickly dispatch Prohaska and his guards and calmly hide his gun under a pinball machine for Wesley to recover later. Then he faces an army of cops and confidently says, I want a lawyer. He wants to jump right into a trial with the self-assurance that he will go free, even going so far as to basically admit his guilt to his lawyers. Which I guess would be inadmissible in court anyways, thanks to lawyer-client privilege. But his entire demeanor flips the minute he reveals Wilson Fisk's name. He freaks out and calls Matt a coward for not going through with his threat of killing him. Fisk's name is scary enough to make this hardened killer kill himself to escape his wrath. And then we cut over to the man himself doing one of the most innocuous things ever. Visiting an art gallery and looking at one of the most lazy paintings I've ever seen. S seriously who would like this? I guess Wilson does, I think. I mean, he says it makes him feel lonely, so maybe not? Regardless, it resonates with him, and he meets the curator named Vanessa, who will become a very important person to him. I absolutely love how the main plot of this episode builds up the fear Wilson instills, and when we finally meet him, he's awkwardly talking to a girl about being lonely. In the span of like 10 minutes, I've come to simultaneously fear him, but also empathize with him. It's a very nice bit of writing. This episode also introduces the final member of the main cast, journalist Ben Urich, who is the guy who published the Union Allied story. Unfortunately, the story did not inspire the action or even the outrage necessary to cause significant change. His boss, Mitchell Ellison, wants him to only write civic stories that will actually sell newspapers like the color of a new subway line. Instead of cool stories about criminal conspiracies that may be tied to a masked man beating up Russians. I have no idea what the modern newspaper buyer is smoking, but I kind of want some of it. Give me that. What? Give me that. I have had enough stress in my life about current world events. This paints the picture of a populace who are content to live in ignorance of those conspiring against them, or maybe they're just living in fear. This is also reflected in Ben's introductory scene where he meets with his mob contact, Silvio. Silvio is planning to move to Florida because the landscape of New York crime has dramatically shifted thanks to the Kingpin's takeover. Used to be if you killed a man, you sent his wife flowers. Now they just send his wife with him. However, Ben resolves to continue the good fight while Silvio retreats. 
Bin becomes an even more admirable character when it's revealed that he's struggling to pay the insurance that is giving his wife the treatment that she needs. And he never resorts to underhanded tactics to get that done. His honesty and earnestness causes the people in his life to support him and help him. Despite the hardships in his life, he continues to pursue goodness and sometimes the universe rewards him. The other B-plot of the episode follows Karen as she's pressured by Union Ally to sign another NDA. She's desperate to find someone to help her fight against this company, even going to Daniel Fisher's widow to ask her. However, Miss Fisher has already signed the NDA for the sake of her children. Much like Karen, she holds herself responsible for Daniel's death. She was the one to encourage him to pursue the pension scandal and that led him to be brutally murdered. Now, she can't afford to do that again and risk the lives of anyone else she cares about. Much like Silvio, she'd rather run away and honestly, who could blame her? I'm glad we had this bit of resolution to the Daniel Fisher murder because after episode 1, I was wondering what his wife's reaction to this would be, and I completely forgot this scene existed. Good job, show. Karen manages to find a kindred spirit with Ben going to his office and offering to help him with his story. Once again, despite the fear that Wilson Fisk inspires, this episode offers a glimmer of hope to those willing to fight back against him. However, at first, Ben shoots down Karen's attempts to help him. He explains that every single one of his informants have either been killed or driven out of town for helping him expose those in power, underestimating what they will do to stay there. He tells Karen to forget about Union Allied and their conspirators before leaving. However, Karen ignores his commands, setting out to take on UA herself. While attending an auction for Union Allied's equipment in an attempt to get a lead, Karen is surprised by Ben, who is there to do the same thing. He relents and allows Karen to join his investigation under the condition that she sign UA's NDA, which will add a layer of protection for her. The main plot revolves around Matt's continued war with the Chechnins. With Prohaska dead, they are now free to take over his taxicab business for extra income and transportation for Gao's heroin. However, thanks to the continued interference from Matt, their income continues to be short of what Wilson requires. Wesley offers them some added protection, but Vladimir sees this as an attempted takeover while his brother Anatoly seriously considers the offer. This is the primary focus of the episode, the relationship between Vladimir and Anatoly. After escaping from prison in Siberia, they pledge to go to America to live as kings. However, they are subject to yet another man who doesn't respect them. Vladimir's pride has caused him to become embittered, while Anatoly is realizing that one must have humility to achieve the life they want. Together, they make one final attempt to get a win against the masked man. They visit fake Foster in the hospital and inject him with epinephrine in order to question him. He tells them where Claire lives and they raid her apartment, finding her friend Santino. After some gentle persuasion, Santino reveals where Claire's new safe house is. She manages to call Matt on the burner phone he gave her earlier in the episode before being dragged away. Matt arrives too late, but is able to get a lead from Santino about the Russian's new taxi company. We then get a really cool action set piece that places us in the perspective of the Russian crooks instead of Matt. Since he's facing multiple opponents, who are actually carrying guns for once, Matt has to approach this strategically. He shuts off the lights, which gives him an advantage being blind and all, and proceeds to systematically take down the Russians one man at a time. Because we're in the perspective of the goons, there's a nice tension that's built up as they flail around trying to defeat this unknown enemy. Despite their superior man and gun power, they've already lost and don't know it yet. Matt rescues Claire and takes her back to his apartment to patch her up from the Russians' interrogation methods. He's dealing with a heavy amount of guilt for this and starting to doubt his mission. He sees the city going to hell and everything he's done has only put people he cares about in danger. Claire encourages him, saying that her and others are living in fear and need someone like him to stand up for them. This encourages him to press on with his mission. Back at the taxicab garage, the Rangskahovs find the aftermath of Matt's attack. Anatoly finally convinces Vladimir to let go of his pride and seek help from Wilson Fisk, even if it means letting him take over operations. At about that time, their henchman Pyotr, whom Vlad had assigned to follow Wesley earlier, phones to say that the kingpin has surfaced. Anatoly decides to speak to him man to man in order to lay the past behind and forge a better future for everyone. However, things don't go according to plan. 
You see, Wilson has spent this entire episode trying to woo art curator Vanessa, and I gotta say, I love how the show continues to build upon the fear Wilson instills among the citizens of New York, while it shows the man himself in the flesh being a socially awkward, love-struck weirdo. In every scene with him and Vanessa this episode, I'm actively rooting for the guy. Vanessa herself almost acts as the audience surrogate as we get to know more about him. He explains a little bit of his backstory and lets slip a little of what he plans to do. That the city was a part of me, that it was in my blood. I would do anything to make it a better place for people like you. This correlates with something that Matt tells Claire in the very same episode. I'm, I'm just trying to make my city a better place, that's all. With this simple parallel, the show establishes how similar our main hero and villain are without them even meeting yet. But in regards to the scenes with Wilson and Vanessa, it's a pleasant little love story. Unfortunately, it's broken when Anatoly crashes the pleasant evening, causing Fisk's guards, who take up like half of the people in the restaurant, to escort him out. Vanessa is a little perturbed by this and ends the evening, unsure of if she wants to indulge in a second date. I went out with you because there's something different about you. Yeah, Wilson ain't like the other boys. Normal fellows will try to riz a girl up by buying her nice things or publicly embarrassing her on his dumb podcast, but Wilson's the type of guy to decapitate a man's head with a car door if he ruins your nice evening. You embarrassed me. You embarrassed me in front of her. This scene is absolutely great. Anatoly thinks he's being honorable in his actions, approaching Fisk face to face to hash out their differences, but instead he ruined a nice dinner that was important to the kingpin. Wesley hypes his boss up with a monologue about how the past is never forgotten before we are shown exactly why Wilson Fisk is so feared in New York. He'd like to have a word with you. <laughs> Let's not forget that Anatoly's execution is probably the definitive death of Daredevil thanks to its sheer brutality. It shows us quite well the savagery Wilson is capable of, while also highlighting his major character flaw, his anger. However, this doesn't mean that he lets his fury loose thoughtlessly, because he knows just what to do with Anatoly's body. He initiates his plan in the next episode where he truly proves his mettle as a villain. He sends Anatoly's body to Vladimir along with Matt's mask to provoke Vlad to go on a manhunt for the man in the mask. The man in the mask. Yes, thank you Wesley, that's what I said. While Vladimir is distracted, Wilson prepares his other partners for a takeover. Wilson will take over the Russians' assets but split the profits among his partners. Profits will be divided up equally among us. Once he's ready, he sends Turk Barrett to Vladimir to insinuate that Wilson and the masked man are working together, provoking Vladimir to start preparing for an all-out war. Vladimir also tells Turk to put out a million dollar bounty for information on the Kingpin's whereabouts. While all this is going down, Wilson gets a second attempt at a date with Vanessa. He makes a pledge to be honest with her, revealing a lot of information about him as a character. He lets it be known that he views Wesley as a friend, but Vanessa presses him on why he feels lonely if he has friends, forcing him to reveal the nature of his work. See, when he said he was going to make the city a better place, he meant he was going to burn it to the ground so it can be reborn anew, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Wilson explains that he doesn't take pleasure in his brutality, but he believes it necessary to accomplish his plan, as is working with the criminal element of Hell's Kitchen. However, he promises that they will get their comeuppance. He has his maitre d' Cecil call in the bounty, causing Vlad to bring all of his men for a raid. Gao sends her blind drug men to the Russians' warehouses where they commit a Boston bombing, except for, you know, it's, it's in Hell's Kitchen. So, a, a Hell's Kitchen bombing. With this move, Wilson has officially beaten Vladimir. So far we've seen the power he has and the fear he inflicts, but now he's proven himself to be worthy of it all. He makes one mistake out of anger and is able to immediately spin up a plan to take advantage of it. He uses Anatoly's body to provoke Vladimir's rage, which will keep him distracted while Wilson consolidates his forces together. Once he's ready, he decides to be a silly billy and spread some false information about his connection with the man in the mask. He knows that this will piss Vlad off further, finding out his mortal enemy works for the boss he despises. 
Obviously, Vlad will gather all of his forces together for an all-out attack. Wilson has expertly manipulated his enemy into bringing all of his forces together in only a few key locations. He had Madame Gao lure Vlad into a sense of complacency with regular drug shipments so that once the time comes, these delivery boys can easily slip through the cracks and destroy them. We now see that Wilson Fisk is a cunning strategist who can easily crush his enemies with a spur-of-the-moment plan, making him a worthy and intimidating foe for Matt to go up against. Wilson explains to Vanessa as this is happening that these men were human traffickers and thugs. Good. I guess Vanessa's on board. Fellas, get a woman like this a ride-or-die type of bride, yeah? Although she does talk about her body count on a second date. A prince. <laughs> Didn't know he was one at first. I slept with him. So, you know, that, that may be a little bit of a red flag there. Meanwhile, Nelson and Murdoch receive another client. Mrs. Cardenas is a kindly old woman who's being forced out of her apartment by her landlord, Armin Tully, who wants to replace the apartments with condos. Matt splits the crew up to help her out. Matt will go to the police station to research any complaints filed by other tenants, while Foggy and Karen will go to talk to Tully's lawyers, Landman and Zack. The issue with Foggy's assignment is that he has to speak with his ex-girlfriend Marcy Stull, who represents Tully. Gosh, she's so hateable. She seems very callous towards Mrs. Cardenas' situation. I mean, bitch can't even get her name right. And did Mrs. Carnitas tell you? Cardenas and tries to trick Foggy into giving up, but he stands up to her, telling her that they're going to court. That evening, the pair visit Miss Cardenas, and Foggy volunteers to help fix up her apartment. Man, Foggy hasn't gotten a lot yet to do character-wise, but the show is absolutely succeeding in making him a likable character to root for. After successfully fixing the sink, Foggy and Karen are rewarded with a little date night. Honestly, I think these two are a pretty cute couple. They got some nice chemistry. I want you to touch my face. Too bad this doesn't really go anywhere. On Matt's side of the investigation, he meets with Brett at the police department who goes to get the complaints against Tully. However, Matt has another reason for being there. A day earlier, Claire told him that the Russians who kidnapped her kept saying the name Vladimir, so Matt went out to find him which is some unfortunate timing now that they think he's a headsman. He finds some Russians who are dropping off one of Gao's drugmen. There's a neat little one take in the taxi where the camera pivots on a stick to reveal a certain man in a black mask while the drug boy sings. I love how the oneer cuts the minute drug boy gets shot. It's a neat little bit of editing right there. After a fight, Matt is only really able to dispatch Piotr when the cops arrive. At the police station, Piotr is conveniently being interrogated while Matt waits for Brett. Like seriously, why did they wait all night to interrogate a drug smuggling, child trafficking, murderous gangbanger? Did Hoffman and Blake just like call dibs and sleep in late? <laughs> Regardless, the two do some very light questioning, and Piotr decides to rat out Kingpin's real name. Uh, Blake immediately shoots him. Turns out the two work for Fisk. Wow, what a twist. Well, not really. Oh no, who could have foreseen this? You take that tone with me again? I don't care if you're blind. I'll kick the shit out of you. Matt reverses Blake's threat and beats him up. He tries to interrogate the guy, but Blake isn't one to give up information easily. Darn it. So Matt elects to just steal his burner phone. Claire finds a list of addresses for all the Russian strongholds, so Matt uses them to track down Vladimir. There's also a subplot around Claire falling in love with Matt, but she can't bring herself to commit to a man who has forced himself to become a devil to fight demons. The romance pretty much ends after this episode, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway, Matt tracks Vlad down right as Wilson initiates his plan. The two manage to survive the explosion and have a confrontation. Matt just starts wailing on the guy, but he's interrupted by the police, led by a guy named Officer Corbin. It seems like Blake wasn't the only one to receive those addresses. Matt initially allows the police to detain him, but when he realizes that these are dirty cops planning to kill everyone there, he springs into action, taking them all out and running away with Vladimir. This kicks off a massive manhunt for the two. They coop up in a condemned building so Matt can patch Vladimir up from a bullet wound he received. I really like these two's interactions. Matt is just trying to get some intel on Fisk, but Vladimir is openly hostile towards him. 
suck my dick. I mean, it's understandable seeing as how he thinks Matt decapitated his brother, but this allows Vlad to call Matt out on some of his BS, especially the no killing rule. Yeah, I, I think I got some questions on that as well. He points out that his buddy Foster would probably prefer being dead than being in a coma from extreme cranial trauma. You think you're different? From me? From him? But you'll get there sooner or later. We all do. Men like us. I may be inclined to agree at this point. Anyway, Matt has to cauterize Vladimir's gunshot wound with some guidance over the phone from Claire. However, since the process is obviously a painful one, old Vlad screams like a little bit. Anyway, these screams alert a nearby rookie cop. He calls it in and investigates. Matt jumps him and tries to get him to call in an all clear, but being the nice young officer he is, he confirms Matt's location before getting knocked out. Hey, you know what? Can't blame the guy. I mean, he's one of the few good cops in Hell's Kitchen, and for all he knows, Matt is the bad guy, seeing as how he jumped some of his fellow officers. He did a good job tonight. I hope he has a long and happy career. <laughs> Alright. Well, now the cops know where Matt and Vladimir are, and they surround the building. Hoffman and Blake, of course, immediately show up and take over the scene. Hoffman calls this in to Wesley, and he and Wilson make plans to kill Matt and Vlad. Wilson wants to take care of this issue as soon as possible. It's bad enough that Vladimir is still alive, but the others will become restless with his temporary failure. Now that Vlad and Matt have been located, he wants them both dead as quickly as possible. However, there's a bit of a complication. Ben deduced the same thing Matt did last episode about the Russian bases and has shown up on the scene. If Fisk's private police force indiscriminately murder everybody in that building, Ben will be able to report their corruption to the city. Now, they could also kill Ben, but I guess that would complicate things a little further. Instead, Wilson has a different plan. To set the stage, he brings in the media as his step one. Back inside the building, Matt is having a little bit of luck with Vlad. He reveals how Fisk roped him and his brother into the big criminal organization, but then he starts to trail off after saying he'd reveal the name of Wilson's accountant. Matt leans in to catch what he's saying, allowing Vladimir to suddenly attack him, leading them to crash through the unstable floor. Matt, dude, why the hell did you lean in? You have super hearing, my guy. We've seen you be able to hear things from three floors down, hear a hairline fracture inside of somebody, and in this very episode, you've been able to hear everything happening outside of the building. Just use your super hearing to hear what he's saying. Leaning in just allows him to attack you. Down below, Vladimir dies, but Matt is able to bring him back to life, causing Vlad to mock him further. Outside, Wesley retrieves a police radio while Blake uses the arrival of a SWAT team to tell everyone to swap radio channels. This enables Wilson to call the rookie's radio, which is now in the possession of Matt. This is the first time our main protagonist interacts with the main antagonist. Wilson gives Matt the classic, We're the same, you and I, Spider-Man. However, instead of proposing a team-up, Wilson is noting these similarities to explain why he has to kill Matt. Both of them are idealistic men working outside of the law in order to make their city a better place. Their methods interfere with each other, and neither of them will deviate from their will. Like Vladimir will point out later, this can only end with one of them killing the other. However, Wilson offers Matt an out. All he has to do is kill Vladimir to go free. Obviously, that goes against Matt's rules, so Wilson enacts his plan. He sends surveillance footage of Matt's fight with the corrupt cops to the local news stations in order to paint Matt as this deranged criminal who's holding a cop hostage with the leader of the Russian mob. I do have a question, though. How is this possible? Like, it's pretty convenient that the building that somehow survived being next door to a massive explosion happened to have a working security camera pointed directly at Matt at this moment. It's not impossible, I suppose, but it's a little bit of a stretch. Wilson also positions a sniper on the building across the street to shoot some of the cops on site to stir up hysteria. I'm very surprised that Ben doesn't at all question why the shot came from a different building than the one the man in the mask is currently holed up in, but I guess he was caught up in the hysteria with a guy getting shot in front of him and all. This is also blamed on Matt, by the way. Blake is also targeted by the sniper since Wilson is miffed at him for losing his phone to Matt earlier. This spurs the SWAT team to raid the building. 
Matt finds a storm grate that leads to access tunnels below and Vlad helps him remove it, intent on not dying on his back. The SWAT team kills the rookie, probably to pin that on Matt as well, and follow them. Matt manages to fend off the first squad, but Vladimir volunteers to stay behind and make sure Matt escapes. Before Matt leaves, Vlad tells him that the only way he can beat Fisk is to kill him, and he imparts the name of Fisk's accountant in hope that Matt will do so. Leland Owsley. He will give you what you think you want. With that, Vlad goes out in a blaze of glory while Matt escapes. Despite being a human trafficking, serial murdering, child kidnapping gangster, the show succeeds in making Vladimir kind of likable. He's a man who wanted to make a better life for himself and his brother, but his pride and arrogance led him to become subject to a man who doesn't respect him, with that man eventually becoming his enemy. He's by no means a good person, but the show does a good job at making him feel like an actual human being despite being one of the biggest pieces of crap imaginable. There's also a little B-plot that follows Foggy and Karen taking Mrs. Cardenas to the hospital where Claire happens to work. Foggy realizes he's also injured, and while he's being treated, he sees Wilson's propaganda and buys into it, which will set up conflicts between him and Matt for a little bit. Foggy brings his opinions on the man in the mask to work when he gets out of the hospital. Once he's worn himself out on the subject, he tries to ask out Karen for a second date, but she's a little busy that night. Batting practice, you and me, Chelsea Piers, what do you say? Um, I... Or not. Totally cool. Foggy is concerned that she's hiding secrets from him and Matt, but Matt tells Foggy to leave it be while he researches Leland Owlsley. Gee, I wonder why Matt doesn't want Foggy investigating into people's secrets. That night, Karen meets with Ben, bringing him the Tully case. He says that if she can bring some definitive proof that it's connected to the Union Allied scandal and the vast array of organizations behind it, then he'll print the story. Karen also asks him about the man in the mask. I'm glad they gave him a measured response to the insanity in the last episode. Ben has a skeptical nature, so he doesn't 100% buy into the lies that are being spread by the media, but he doesn't necessarily trust the man in the mask either. My experience? There are no heroes. No villains. Just people with different agendas. Karen's next stop is Miss Cardenas' apartment to gather some information. Tully's in the wind, but Karen is able to get a description of the thugs that carried out his orders. It just so happens that those thugs aren't too happy about Karen's meddling, so they jump her as she leaves Miss Cardenas' apartment. Fortunately, Foggy steps in to save her. He had followed her out of concern for whatever she was hiding from him, so she decides to show him. What part of don't tell anyone about this didn't you understand? I have another question. What happened to you're not going to show up to my office, Ben? You need to be smart. Smarter than they are. Don't visit me at the office anymore. And don't tell anyone else about this. I thought that was a very important rule to you. And honestly, a very smart one. But I guess we got to officially introduce Foggy to the conspiracy board. While all this is happening, Matt finds Leland as he meets with Nobu. Leland is understandably a little jumpy after all that's happened with the Chechnyans, so he wants to form an alliance with the mysterious Japanese man. However, Nobu is more of an every-man-for-himself type of guy, so he rejects the offer. Matt jumps Leland, wanting some information on Fisk. He's startled, however, when he hears the familiar sound of a guiding stick tapping the ground, allowing Leland to tase him and escape. Enter... Stick. Hey, that's the name of the episode. As revealed in flashbacks throughout the episode, Stick was brought in to treat Matt's severe sensitivity in his five senses. He revealed that Matt's blindness gave him access to a gift that few possess, the ability to interact with the world that no normal human can. Using his senses, Matt can gather a wealth of information including anything from food ingredients to people's life stories. Stick trained Matt to become a soldier in an upcoming war, teaching him how to turn his body into a living weapon. Unfortunately, Matt grew to see Stick as a fatherly replacement for Jack, and upon gifting him a bracelet made of the ice cream wrapper from the day they first met, Matt is abandoned by Stick, crushing his heart. And, and his bracelet. 
Now, Stick has returned to New York. He's been tracking down a dangerous weapon called the Black Sky. Thanks to some persuasive methods, Stick has discovered that the Black Sky is going to be delivered to Nobu here in Hell's Kitchen. Whoever Nobu works for, that is who Stick is warring against. The Black Sky will apparently be used to destroy all of New York, and Stick wants Matt to help him destroy it. And in the process, this will also be a blow against Fisk. Matt reluctantly agrees, but only if Stick promises not to kill anyone. I swear I will not kill anybody. Pussy. Much like Vladimir, Stick tells Matt that he can't commit to half measures when trying to save Hell's Kitchen. The only way he can win is to cross that line. Regardless, he commits to Matt's request and they proceed with the mission. At the docks, Stick tasks Matt with taking out the guards while he handles the Black Sky. Matt once again systematically takes out Nobu's goons. Don't know why no one was alerted by this guy splashing into the water. They must be some deaf-ass ninjas. It's revealed that the Black Sky is a child, and not wanting to be an accessory to murder, Matt prevents Stick from putting an arrow into the kid's heart. This alerts the guards to Matt's position, and while he's busy with them, Stick slips off and kills the Black Sky. How exactly was this kid a threat? I kind of wish it was explained the danger this guy posed to New York. Is he a mutant? A walking nuke? Was he going to grow up to become the next big dictator? Why was it so pertinent to kill a kid? I get that Stick's all like, the mission. And I would understand if the Black Sky ended up being like the freaking Infinity Gauntlet or something, but this is a child. You kind of have to justify killing it if you want to make this action a morally gray one. And yes, I understand that the Black Sky stuff is going to be expanded upon in the Defenders series, but that is also like four or five seasons from now. I would kind of like at least a hint of an explanation in this show. Matt is just as pissed about this and attacks Stick back at his apartment. After over a decade, Matt is able to finally beat his teacher and kicks him out of Hell's Kitchen. As a consolation prize, Matt also gets Stick's respect for whatever that's worth. The fight destroyed Matt's apartment, and as he cleans up, he finds the bracelet he tried to give Stick all that time ago, indicating that Stick may have a heart after all. This recontextualizes Stick's conversation with Matt earlier. He scolded Matt for living a comfortable life full of nice possessions, a good job, and close friends. He told Matt to cut the people he cared about out of his life in order to protect them and to become the warrior needed to win the coming war. It seems like Stick did the same thing when he left Matt, making him a much more complex character than just some blind guy who beats up children and kills others. <laughs> Yes, he's a bit of a dick who emotionally destroyed a kid and stole his inheritance, but it's possible he did this because he was scared that he actually cared for his child soldier, and just, I guess, needed the money. <laughs> this action was to keep himself on his warpath, and in his own mind, keep Matt safe. Stick is a solid character, and I can't wait to see more of him, as well as this scarred up dude Stick reports to at the end of the episode. What? He doesn't come back for the rest of the show? It's not even mentioned at all? Uh, Alright, cool. Matt comes into the office the next day to find out about Foggy and Karen's investigation. He forces his way into it and tries to keep them safe by only investigating through the legal pathways. During their investigation, the name Confederated Global Investment, the company that hired Nelson and Murdoch for John Healy's case, pops up in some documents. One of its subsidiaries is Westmeyer Holt Contracting, which is doing a similar scheme that Tully was pulling on Mrs. Cardenas. Before they can dive too deep into it, news breaks that Detective Blake has woken up from his coma after getting shot, so Matt goes to interrogate him. Before he gets there, Blake is poisoned by his partner, Hoffman. Matt manages to knock Hoffman out and gather the information he needs. Based on the good words of Karen and Foggy, Matt decides to trust Ben Yurick to take the information to the public. Unfortunately, Wilson Fisk has other plans. Fisk effectively takes over as the main character for this episode. He's struggling to hold himself together as his organization starts to fall apart. 
Nobu is pissed about losing the Black Sky, even though, as Wilson correctly reminds him, the Kingpin did everything that was asked of him, and losing the Black Sky was all on the Japanese. Nobu takes offense to this and threatens to kill Wilson if this type of thing keeps up. Wesley wants to teach him a lesson for insulting his buddy, but Wilson urges caution. Wesley is also frustrated that Nobu doesn't add anything to the organization, yet gets special treatment, but Wilson tells him, Necessary evil. I guess that will be explored a little later. Leland is getting progressively more jumpy, especially after his latest attack from the man in the mask. He's gotten comfortable openly mocking Wilson without fear of reprisal. It's gotten to the point in this organization that this pencil-pushing dweeb feels comfortable blatantly questioning the man who decapitated someone with a car door. It doesn't help that Blake is now awake and threatens to spill secrets about Fisk's organization because, well... I don't think he appreciates getting shot. The situation is further complicated when they find out that the cops guarding Blake's room aren't on the take, so their only option to take Blake off the playing board is to have his partner Hoffman do it. This scene really made me feel for Hoffman. Daryl Edwards does such a great job at displaying the pain Hoffman is going through when making the decision to kill his partner. They have been friends for over 30 years, and now he's being asked to kill a man he's known since they were children. But, you know, with some bribery, Wilson is able to push Hoffman to go through with it. After being attacked by the man in the mask, Hoffman is able to place blame for Blake's death on him and get away with murder. Unfortunately for Wilson, though, his troubles keep piling on. Madame Gao interrupts his morning routine the next day. While she respects him for the kindness he's extended to her and for playing dumb by pretending not to speak foreign languages, she too has grown concerned about their organization. She sees him making the same mistakes as the Russians. He's grown sloppy and emotional, causing him to make mistakes, such as allowing the location of his home to become known to Madame Gao. She warns him that if he doesn't put his house in order, he'll be cut out of the organization. This causes Wilson to become emotional and sloppy. Seriously, Wilson, somebody's gotta clean up after you, bro. Luckily, Wesley is the world's best friend and brings Vanessa in to comfort him. Wilson tries to push her away, but she refuses to leave his side, telling him to let her in on what's bothering him. So, Wilson opens up about the childhood he's kept hidden. Wilson Fisk grew up in the poor neighborhoods of Hell's Kitchen. His father, Bill, had big plans. He wanted to run for city council and accept bribes in order to move into a nice neighborhood and provide a decent life for himself and his family. What a stand-up guy. Bill is tired of people looking down on him and being subject to bullies, and he wants to make sure Wilson grows up to be the same way. Unfortunately, he loses the race and becomes a laughingstock to some of the local community members, like Bernie here. Bernie was knocking down Bill's campaign signs and beat up Wilson when the kid confronted him. Bill uses this as a learning opportunity. Kick him. Wilson is not too thrilled about curb stomping a peer, so Bill puts him in timeout, telling him to stare at a wall and think about the man he wants to become while he goes to talk to mob boss Rigoletto to sort out the loan he was given for his campaign. This is the same Rigoletto that Silvio worked under before Wilson took over in the present. However, his wife Marlene is fed up with the disastrous path he's leading his family down. Thinking that Marlene is just like everyone else who's put him down, Bill starts beating his wife until Wilson decides to finally take a stand against his father. You believe this kid? He gets that shit from you. Oh fuck, I can't believe you've done this. Marlene tells Wilson to grab a saw so they can chop up and dispose of his body. And thus is the tragedy of Wilson Fisk. He was the son of a man who was maligned and put down by society, becoming subject to mob bosses and those richer than him. He was fed up with being afraid and in turn became a monster who ruled over his family with violence and abuse, weaponizing the very fear that was instilled into him. Now, Wilson has used the same tactics as the kingpin of crime. In fact, the reason he wears Bill's cufflinks is to remind him that his brutality and fear has a point. That he isn't his father, being cruel for the sake of cruelty. Every act of brutality that Wilson takes, he likes to think is a deliberate step towards a greater good and not just fueling a primal desire. But now he questions whether or not he's become the very monster he wanted to avoid becoming. 
The man with the mask threatens to expose him and his allies are turning on him, so Wilson wonders if he should roll on his back and accept it. However, Vanessa is there to reassure him that he isn't like his father, and he can affect great change in Hell's Kitchen. With this woman by his side, Wilson announces his presence at a press conference just as Ben is writing an expose on him, foiling his enemies yet again. There's a neat repeated scene throughout the episode that follows Wilson as he goes through his morning routine. He experiences a nightmare of his father and then looks at Rabbit in a snowstorm to calm himself down. Now that I get a good look at it, the painting looks pretty similar to the wall he was staring at as a child. I think this recontextualizes why Wilson connected to this painting so much. It doesn't so much make him think of the man he wants to become, but rather think of the man he doesn't want to become. The next step of Wilson's morning routine is making an omelette while listening to J.S. Cello Suite No. 2. After enjoying his homemade meal, he picks out one of his mini black suits to wear and attaches his father's cufflinks. The shadow of his younger self in the mirror is a reflection, pun 100% intended, of how Wilson's entire life has been defined by his fear of becoming his father. The next time we see the morning routine, Madame Gao is interrupting, showing how the fear of his past is making him sloppy enough to allow him to be found. The King's Castle has been compromised and the privacy Wilson has carefully maintained has been breached. Then with his newfound confidence in Vanessa, Wilson's morning routine changes. Instead of staring at his painting, he stares at her. She picks out a lighter grey suit for him to wear and she gives him new cufflinks. This change indicates that Wilson has grown past the fear of becoming his father and now strives to be worthy of the woman he loves. That's the kind of man he's going to become. We then shift the spotlight to our main protagonist. Matt's main struggle right now is whether or not he should kill Fisk. Both Vladimir and Stick have told Matt that the only way he can win this war and save this city is to kill him, and now Matt is thinking they might be right. He seeks guidance from Father Lantum. Do you believe in the devil, Father? Do you believe he exists? in this world huh? among us. Lantum gives Matt some theologically dubious information. The devil was inconsequential, minor figure in the grand scheme. I mean, the Bible makes a pretty big deal about Lucifer being the enemy, but whatever. He tells his sheep of a time he saw the devil in the eyes of man. This is pretty much setting up the idea that there are people out there who are pure evil, but the question is whether or not Fisk is. Meanwhile, the investigation into Fisk has hit some obstacles. Hoffman is in the wind after killing his partner. Fisk is a partial owner of Confederated Global, but the tenement scandal that its subsidiary is involved in can't be pegged on him. Officially, Tully has owned those buildings until yesterday, and now he's on an island somewhere with no extradition laws. Mrs. Cardenas comes by to reveal that Fisk has doubled the offer for her to leave her apartments, but Foggy encourages her to hold out and gather fellow tenants to fight against him. However, Matt worries that the fighting back may make the situation worse. He decides to try something different, investigate Fisk's allies. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Leland is heavily guarded thanks to the incident from a few nights ago, and Wesley just seems to be a corporate suit, so Matt narrows his focus down to the woman. Vanessa. He visits her art gallery in order to get a better sense of his enemy. While he's window shopping with Vanessa, the man of the hour arrives. Man, the tension between these two is palpable. Matt struggles to keep it together, but he does learn a couple of things about Fisk. He truly believes he's making the city a better place, and he has someone he loves and who loves him. This furthers Matt's crisis of conscience, driving him back to Father Lantum. He tells the father about his meeting with Vanessa, and Lantum notes that people are complex, which is why vengeance and judgment are best left to the Lord. He provides some very pertinent insight for Matt to dwell on. Are you struggling with the fact that you don't want to kill this man, but have to, or that you don't have to kill him, but want to? I don't believe you went to see this woman for insight into how to kill a man. I think maybe you went looking for a reason not to. Matt receives some mixed news upon returning to the office later. Good news, everyone! Foggy and Karen have identified the guys who jumped them a couple episodes ago, but the bad news is they've disappeared. Good news! <laughs> 
Good news, Nelson and Murdoch officially have their own plaque. Bad news, Mrs. Cardenas is dead. The official report is that she was stabbed in a mugging by a junkie, but Matt is highly suspicious of this. He brings up his suspicions at the impromptu wake at Josie's bar. Foggy and Karen seem to buy the idea that Fisk was somehow behind this, but they don't know what to do. Suddenly, Fisk appears on the news to make a statement about Mrs. Cardenas' death. He calls out the man in the mask and the disease of fear he's spreading throughout the city, holding him directly responsible for her death. This sets Matt off and he goes out to find Fisk. He beats his way across Hell's Kitchen until he finds the junkie who killed Mrs. Cardenas. He points Matt in the direction of Pier 81 where he was paid to do the deed. But as it pretty obviously turns out, it's a trap. See, thanks to the loss of the Black Sky, Nobu's bosses have been pressuring him to finish their building project, which in turn piles pressure on to Wilson. The issue is that one of the tenements has been resisting his offers to move out, which happened to be Mrs. Cardenas and her neighbors. Fisk thinks it will only be a matter of time before he can get them all to move out, but Nobu has run out of patience, so Fisk makes a deal that he'll accelerate the evictions if he takes care of the man in the mask. However, the guy has been pretty inactive as of late, so Fisk uses the masked man's weakness for women and children to lure him out. Although to be fair, I think most normal people have sympathies for any woman or child in need. So, I, you know, pretty, pretty obvious thing to pinpoint. The junkie gets paid to kill Mrs. Cardenas, which would naturally cause the man to recklessly look for him while also shutting down the uprising from the tenants, allowing the building project to move forward. However, Fisk secretly plans to let Nobu and the man in the mask take care of each other to get rid of both of them. Nobu almost beats Matt with his Kyoketsu Shoge, but Matt is able to throw him into a barrel of alcohol and burst the light bulb above him to catch Nobu on fire. See, martial arts is not very effective against good old American alcohol. The fight scene in and of itself is pretty solid, though I'm not a fan of how it's randomly edited in between scenes throughout the episode. As Matt enjoys his Japanese barbecue, hey, looks like you were able to kill somebody. Good job, Matt. Fisk reveals himself to thank Matt for taking care of Nobu for him. He explains that Mrs. Cardenas' death was part of a plan to lure him out, causing Matt's fury to boil over. I'm gonna kill you. Matt just killed a guy, granted inadvertently and in self-defense, and now he's resolved to murder the devil. Unfortunately, he's taken quite a bit of damage from his fight with Nobu, so Wilson makes quick work of Matt. It's disappointing. Bro, what did you expect? My guy over here is so cut up he can barely stand. Of course you are gonna beat him. He leaves Wesley to shoot the man in the mask, but Matt manages to escape. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda wrestled with whether or not this was a dumb decision by Wilson. Like, yes, it's objectively stupid to have your enemy at your feet and then just walk away to let your lackey take care of him, but does this fit in with Wilson Fisk's character? We know that he's not a fan of cruelty for cruelty's sake, and whenever he strategically has someone killed, it's usually as quick and painless as possible. <laughs> Okay, granted, that one was a bit of an exception, but in his defense, he was very mad that his date got interrupted. Anybody would do the same thing. Your Honor, my client was big mad, so I think an exception can be made here. Plus, it's been shown that he shares a level of respect with his adversary, so perhaps he didn't want Matt to suffer any longer, so he's granting him a quick death. Or maybe this was a lapse in judgment, I don't know. Meanwhile, Foggy and Karen are left alone at Josie's. We get a nice reversal of their drinking scene from episode 2. This time, Foggy is wallowing in hopelessness, seeing a city in decline. He blames himself for Mrs. Cardenas' death in the same way Karen had blamed herself for Daniel's, and now it's Karen's turn to provide motivation to move forward. She tells him that they can't bring Mrs. Cardenas back, but they can make those who killed her pay. Once again, like in episode 2, Foggy drunkenly goes to Matt's apartment in the middle of the night. This time, however, there's a crash inside, and Foggy bursts in to see what happened, coming face to face with the man in the mask. The man collapses, and Foggy starts to dial 911, but notices something familiar about him. He hangs up and removes the mask to reveal his best friend. Yeah, I know this is an old meme, what's it to you? I used the Dama de May meme like 20 minutes ago, where were you then? Shut up. Holy crap, this meme was uploaded when I was in kindergarten. Feels so old now. Matt wakes up the next morning to find that Claire had swung by overnight to patch him up. He finds a not-too-happy Foggy waiting for him. 
Despite being angry about the dishonesty, Foggy covers for Matt when Karen calls. In exchange for continuing his lie, he wants to know everything, and so Matt divulges everything. How his powers work, how he learned to fight, and even how he started his crusade against crime. After multiple nights of listening to a city full of crime, Matt eventually broke. One night he heard a man abuse his daughter, so he called child services. Unfortunately, the man was able to weasel out of an arrest, leading Matt to take the law into his own hands. He beat the guy into a coma and slept soundly. However, Foggy ain't buying it. This occurred after Matt and Foggy left Landman and Zack, long after Stick abandoned Matt's training, meaning that Matt didn't just get fed up one night, but was training in preparation of ruthlessly beating men up night after night. Foggy's afraid that this is something Matt enjoys. I mean, I can't say I blame him. I'm doing this because I enjoy it. I also can't blame him for feeling hurt. This isn't like finding out your nerdy best friend is Spider-Man. There are severe breaches in trust we're dealing with here. Foggy's best friend has been operating under the pretenses of being completely blind when, from a certain point of view, he can actually see. Not just see, but his enhanced senses allow him insights into people's pasts and even a level of insight into what they're thinking. Matt's lie detecting strikes particularly close to Foggy's sensibilities. Not only does he find it intrusive, but he realizes that every time he's lied to Matt, Matt has just played along in the farce. To Foggy, the man he has come to know as his best friend is a complete lie. Matt has even gotten him and Karen involved in the crusade against Fisk, putting them in danger against their wishes. This all culminates in a final heartbreaking exchange. This city needs me in that mask, Foggy. Maybe you're right. Maybe it does. But I don't. I only never needed my friend. This argument is juxtaposed by the beginning of Matt and Foggy's friendship. From their first time meeting, to pledging to become lawyers together, to quitting Landman and Zack due to moral convictions, to deciding to open their own law firm. We see the trust that is built up between them to the point where Foggy is willing to quit his dream job to follow Matt in an independent practice. The plaque that Foggy drew on the napkin at Josie's represents their trust, and in one night that trust is broken. Foggy returns to the office to pack his things, and he throws the symbol of the trust and friendship between him and Matt in the trash. I really like this argument. Not only does this feel like such a heartbreaking degradation of a strong friendship, but this is a very unique unmasking of a superhero. I mentioned Spider-Man earlier, let me go back to him. When Ned Leeds finds out his best friend is Spider-Man, he's elated and becomes his guy in the chair. This is a good moment of bonding for these two friends, and I feel like that usually happens every time a secret identity is revealed to a close ally. With some notable exceptions. However, unlike those examples, this is a deep betrayal of Matt and Foggy's entire relationship which only really exists thanks to Matt's very specific power set. You know, if he was Batman, it wouldn't sting as much, a reclusive rich dude playing with toys and becoming a superhero. But because the blind lawyer who insists on doing things by the books is a masked vigilante with an extremely invasive power set, it's a complete violation of trust. What's more, this reveal completely redefines the relationship between Matt and Foggy for the rest of the season. They don't make up at the end of this, they don't hug it out, no sunshines and rainbows. This gives us lasting consequences for Matt's lies. This argument is also a clever way to give Matt an entire episode to recover from his injuries from the previous one. It's a simple way to show us that Matt still retains damage from his fights. It's some simple yet pretty smart writing. Meanwhile, Ben is having a hard time as well. After his big story gets shut down by Fisk, his resolve to continue his investigation is waning. Now, his insurance extension request has been denied, leaving Hospice as the only option left for his wife Doris. He decides that she is more important to him than his work, so he gives his investigation board to Karen. She understands and asks him to accompany her to check out a nursing home. On their way there, they have an exchange that fits Matt and Foggy's situation quite well. No, we all have things we hold on to for ourselves that we don't want anyone to know. But there's always someone who does. 
At the nursing home, it's quite clear that it's too expensive for a low-income reporter like Ben, meaning that Karen is here for another reason. They peruse the hallways and suddenly Karen wants to talk to one of the residents about living here, a Mrs. M. Vistain. It starts as an innocent enough conversation until her son is brought up. He's such a good boy. Comes to see me every weekend. And what's his name? Wilson. Oh shit. Speaking of the devil, nope, wait, that was the title of last episode. Wilson is also struggling a bit. Gao's concerns have grown since the death of Nobu, and she worries that his ambitions will turn against her. Unlike her criminal contemporaries, Gao actually believes in Wilson's dream of making Hell's Kitchen a better place, but she fears that he's losing his way thanks to his relationship with Vanessa. I think this explains why Wilson takes such great care to keep Gao happy throughout the season. She shares the same dream as him, so there's a level of respect that isn't shared between the rest of his compadres. Speaking of which, Leland shares these same concerns. Gal's right. You've changed. Change is inevitable. This seems to satisfy him for the time being, and he agrees to speak to Gao to assuage her worries. Everything is looking up for Big Willie as he holds a benefit for his mission to save Hell's Kitchen, but then all hell breaks from the kitchen to come into the ballroom. People start dropping from poison champagne, and Wilson freaks out as he sees the woman he loves amongst the victims. Quick, Leland, try not to act suspicious. Nice. Vanessa is taken to a nearby hospital, and Leland continues to be the poster boy for innocence. Are, are you sure someone shouldn't be looking at me? He brings concerns to Wesley that Wilson was the poisoner's intended victim. The two brainstorm on who could have possibly done this, ruling out the Japanese since they have now officially gotten their city block, and assume that it was the man in the mask who murdered Nobu instead of Fisk. Which... I guess is sort of correct. So that leaves Gao as a potential culprit, so Wesley sends Leland to speak to her. As he waits for his personal specialist to arrive, Wilson is troubled by his own thoughts. Much like Karen and Matt previously, Wilson blames himself for Vanessa's encroachment upon death. If she wasn't by his side, she wouldn't have been targeted by the poisoner. He has Wesley arrange for her to be sent away upon being healed until he knows that it is safe for her to return. Vengeance builds in his heart, and he promises his paramour that he will punish the perpetrators of the poisoning. He receives a call from his mother, but he passes it on to Wesley to focus solely on Vanessa. Before Wesley can handle it, Leland returns to report that Gao is still 100% with them. Did she sound sincere? The hell do I know? She was speaking in Chinese. Leland is more concerned about Wilson getting back to work on their mission, but he's shut himself in Vanessa's hospital room, not wishing to be disturbed. Wesley forces Leland to return home before returning to the Marlene business. She informs him of the visit she recently had, so he gets a piece from the head bodyguard Francis and sets out to resolve the problem. Meanwhile, Matt is still reeling from his fight with Nobu and Foggy. He realizes now that the hatred that overtook him was wrong, but he's in a bit of a self-loathing state. He revisits Father Lantum to seek guidance. He made each and every one of us with a purpose to me, a reason for being. I believe so, yes. Then why did he put the devil in me? He laments his violent nature and questions if it's really God's will to be the devil of Hell's kitchen. Father Lantum provides some more guidance that seems highly suspect theologically speaking. Maybe that was God's plan all along. Why he created him. Allowed him to fall from grace. To become a symbol to be feared. Warning to us all. To tread the path of the righteous. I get that Lantum was a rebellious thinker in seminary, but this is some basic cornerstone concepts of Christianity that he's blatantly getting wrong. Of course, I'm coming at this from a Protestant perspective, so if that's part of Catholic hermeneutics, please let me know in the comments. Regardless, I suppose it steals Matt's resolve to be the devil for Hell's Kitchen to scare it back onto the path of righteousness. Matt also receives another visit from Claire to patch up a busted stitch. She notes that he may need to switch the sweatshirt and cargo pants he bought off Amazon for some proper body armor, which reminds Matt of his fight with Wilson. His suit had a sort of armor in its lining, preventing Matt from doing any substantial damage to him. He figures that Wilson has to have an armorer in the city creating these materials, so he's going to find them and get some armor for himself. He finds Turk Barrett, the guy who knows everything there is to know on the streets, and beats the information out of him, leading him to Melvin Potter. 
Melvin was briefly seen a couple episodes ago and was mentioned in the aftermath of Wilson's head-on, or rather head-off, collision with Anatoly, where the Russian managed to slice his suit open. Here we get a proper introduction to the guy. After a brief fight where Melvin demonstrates his immense strength and references his comic book counterpart Gladiator, Matt is able to beat him. To be fair to Melvin, it looks like someone else took his place there for a second though. Matt learns that Melvin is being forced to work for Fisk under the threat of harm against a woman he cares for. Matt promises to prevent Fisk from hurting Melvin's precious Betsy if Melvin helps him make a new suit. While Matt seems to have found some direction for his mission, Karen finds herself being lost. She has finally made a giant break in her case against Fisk, though while not actionable legally, can do massive damage to his reputation. However, Ben is still rightly upset with her for using his dying wife to deceive him into continuing an investigation he wanted to leave. Karen does her best to convince him to join her, but he rejects it. Personally, I'd have to side with Ben on this one. He has a dying wife to take care of, and Karen just lied to manipulate him into a situation he didn't want to be in. This really makes Karen feel kind of unlikable to me. I get it, Fisk is a major threat to the city, and for all she knows, she's the only person who is willing to try to stop him, but she let herself go too far to get to that goal. Not everyone is made to be a martyr. Sometimes they're just made to take care of those who need it. See, this guy knows what I'm talking about. Karen isn't finding much luck with her other friends either. Matt and Foggy are in the middle of a spat and won't say why, and both of them reject her pursuit of the Marlene story. Karen first approaches Matt, then Ben, and then finally after searching for hours, she finds Foggy, the man who is stuck by her side constantly, a man she could always count on, a man who has always encouraged her and supported her, and yet even he burns her. Karen's at the end of her rope. Everything is falling apart right at the precipice of beating Fisk, and after being turned away by Foggy, she only has two other people to turn to, both of whom have already rejected her. Matt doesn't answer his phone as per usual, so Karen is forced to turn to Ben. After she pours her frustrations and fear out, Ben lends a word of encouragement, hinting that at least their relationship can mend soon. They make plans to talk tomorrow, and Ben continues his investigation into Fisk's past. Looks like he can't quite rid himself of his journalistic curiosity. Karen returns home, relieved to have found some solace at the end of the- oh, there she goes. Karen wakes up in an abandoned building some time later. She's been taken by Wesley, who puts her under gunpoint to showcase his dominance. He wants to hire her to dissuade Ben and anyone else she's roped into her story from pursuing their campaign against Wilson. Wes clearly feels superior to her, which is further made clear when he explains how much he hates Hell's Kitchen. It's a dump, a hive of scum and villainy, and yet he stays there because it's his best friend's dream to make it better. Unfortunately for him, at that moment, that very friend becomes worried for him and calls, distracting Wesley long enough for Karen to steal his gun. He tries to bluff that he would never put a loaded weapon within arm's reach of her, but Karen decides to call it. I can't believe you shot me. Now... I feel a little conflicted about this. On one hand, I think it's understandable for Wesley to not immediately kill Karen. She has a web of friends investigating Wilson, and killing her would only make her a martyr, stealing her friend's resolve to keep pushing the investigation. So they would all have to die as well. And as was established in episode 3, Wesley doesn't like leaving a trail of bodies behind. I can buy being momentarily distracted by a phone going off. It happens to me all the time. Oh, hold on, gotta take this. However, what I struggled to comprehend is why Wesley would just leave a loaded gun on the table so Karen could easily take it. It'd be one thing if he had emptied it beforehand as a safety precaution, but you mean to tell me that between the hospital and here he just... forgot? I mean, you weren't even planning on killing Karen in the first place, so why would you purposely have the gun loaded? What makes it more frustrating is that this causes the death of a good character. Wesley was a snobby little guy. Toby Leonard Moore did such a great job depicting the seething disgust his character struggled to contain when he was around the criminals of Hell's Kitchen. To him, the Russians, the Japanese, Karen, the crooked cops, the lawyers, and even to an extent, Madame Gao are all beneath him. The only other guy Wesley seems to have some level of respect for is Leland. He trusted the guy enough to go off and question Gao, and he's the only goon that Wesley would meet one-on-one -on -one to discuss business. This may be because Leland was also a snobby elite. 
the rest of them are grimy cockroaches infesting a rotten city. But despite his personal disdain for Hell's Kitchen and her people, Wesley remained loyal to his friend to the very end. He has a similar role to the arranger from the comic books, who is trusted to see Kingpin's day-to-day -day operations while providing a layer of deniability for the big guy while he was working on bigger projects. However, unlike Wesley, the arranger failed one too many times, leading to his own boss putting a hit out on him. Wesley was an efficient employee, a loyal henchman, but more importantly, he was a good friend. Too bad he died like an absolute moron. Morning comes, and Wilson is still waiting to hear back from his friend. Vanessa finally wakes up, and he catches her up on current events, promising to get vengeance for her. She's resistant to the idea of leaving his side, but Wilson has no time to argue because Wesley has been found. Well, his body at least. Leland is called in to play Perot. He takes the opportunity to place more blame on the Japanese, so Wilson has him dig into their finances. Francis informs his boss of Wesley's phone call the night before, and after a brief moment of frustration, it's my friend! Wilson retrieves the phone to confirm that his mother's phone call was the catalyst for this, so he decides to move his mother to Italy to remove her from danger. Before doing so, he tries to glean some information on who visited her, but, you know, dementia. Leland returns to Fisk to report that it looks like the Japanese may not be behind the attacks on his people, but before they can continue, Fisk suddenly receives an important call and leaves. Meanwhile, Karen disposes of Francis's gun in the Hudson before trying to move on with her life, if her life was just drinking to numb the pain. It doesn't help that she's now being tormented by nightmares of Wilson killing her, prompting her to fast-track the childhood murder story. However, it's the middle of the night, so she returns to the office to try to do some busy work. She's jump-scared by Foggy, who promises her that despite his current beef with Matt bleeding into her life, he is still on board with helping her take down Fisk. She gives him the files that Ben gave her earlier, and he leaves, bumping into Matt on his way out. Well, that wasn't awkward. Karen tries to mend the bridges between Matt and Foggy, but Matt is content to indulge in Foggy's silent treatment. Later, she turns to Ben, pushing for him to publish his article out of fear of Wilson's retribution. Ben wants to wait until his second source, Silvio, who worked for Rigoletto in the past, returns to New York. If you'll remember, Rigoletto was the mob boss that Bill Fisk was in debt to, and who Wilson overthrew in order to become the kingpin. However, upon hearing that Fisk may know about their little visit to his mother, Ben reluctantly agrees to write the story. Meanwhile, Foggy takes the Fisk file to Marcy at Josie's. He's recently reconnected with her after he booty called her up in the aftermath of his argument with Matt. He wants her to help expose Fisk. However, he's a client of Landman and Zack, so if she helps Foggy out, her career will be over. But Foggy is banking on a hunch that deep down, Marcy may still have a soul. One indication of this may be the fact that she actually pronounces Mrs. Cardenas' name correctly in respect for her death after quite bitchily pronouncing it wrong in their last meeting. Matt is also looking for help. He visits Ben in order to get some intel on Madame Gao's heroine. Turns out it's called the Steel Serpent, which is interesting considering that's the name of an Iron Fist villain, but this little thing is connected to the Chinese triads in the city. Matt remembers the blind Chinese kid that the Russians were transporting earlier and deduces is that the triad is using blind people to distribute the steel serpent across Hell's Kitchen, and that the trade must be funding Fisk's operations. If he can deplete Fisk's money supply, maybe that will force the big guy into acting emotionally and making a mistake. Interestingly enough, that's exactly what Fisk did to Matt in episode 9. It seems like Matt may be planning to turn the tables. Matt dons plain clothes to find these sightless distributors, and upon setting his ears upon one, he tails him. I mean, talk about the blind leading the blind. Or I guess more accurately, the blind following the blind, except this blind man can do parkour, which is what he does to go after the blind man that's picked up by a black sedan. After some hardcore parkour, Matt finds one of Gao's heroin production warehouses. That night, he gears up and breaks in, taking out the guards one by one before approaching the production floor. He realizes that all of the workers are not just blind, but they've had their eyes cut out. Before he can process this information, Gao shows herself and sicks her blind dogs on him. 
They seem more panicked than malicious, so maybe they think he's ice or something. Seeing as how they are a room full of doped up blind people, they don't really cause Matt much trouble and he's able to easily catch up with Gal. He takes out her guards, but in the process one of them fires his guns into some explosive barrels, starting a fire. Gal reveals that her blind followers blinded themselves for their cause. They have faith. In you. And in drugs. In something beyond the distractions of your world. Matt tries to interrogate her, but turns out the old lady packs a punch. So Matt is forced to double back to save the blind folks trapped in the fire. On his way out, Matt is cornered by Brett Mahoney, who tries to bring him in. However, Matt has other plans. He tells Brett that Blake and Hoffman were dirty cops working for Fisk before he leaves. Now, is this a chance meeting? Yes, but I think it's believable considering that the man in the mask is public enemy number one right now, and I'm sure any explosions will now be directly connected to him, causing the PD to send as many men as possible to the scene and apprehend him. Later that evening, Gal meets up with Leland, where it's revealed that the two collaborated on Vanessa's poisoning? Say it ain't so! Who could have foreseen this? Leland did such a great job being subtle about it! Since her heroin production has been shut down, Gao uses it as an excuse to officially withdraw from Hell's Kitchen and return home to ruminate on the future. Wheel constantly turns. We must adapt to its position or be crushed beneath it. She leaves Leland with those wise words to figure out how he'll adapt to the turning wheel. And that's the last time we see Gao for the rest of the season. Don't worry, she'll return later in the show, but I find her to be this very intriguing character during the first season. Her and Nobu kind of felt like similar characters, you know, because they're both Asian. <coughs> okay, but for real, they are both these nebulous characters who are working towards greater purposes than Kingpin's plan. The Rangskahovs just wanted to live like kings, and Leland is a greedy elite, but these two seem to have something bigger in the works, which teases some future storylines. Between the two, I gravitate more toward Gal. Nobu is kind of a stereotypical stoic Japanese ninja guy who really wants this city block. He just seems to be a representative of an unknown organization of nefarious intentions. However, Gao just has more going on. She actually has a rapport with Wilson and seems to genuinely care about him and his goals. She tries to offer guidance to her allies out of respect for them. Even her heroin trade has more intrigue than just, Get city block and receive doomsday child. There seems to be a spiritual purpose for the trade, one that is motivated by such strong conviction that our followers blind themselves out of faith for that purpose. The heroine is also named after an Iron Fist villain and seeing how her home is quote, considerably further than China, and she has insane martial arts skills, this may indicate a connection to the mystical city of Kunlun. This all combines to make an interesting supporting antagonist who teases the direction of the Netflix Marvel Universe while still being largely non-intrusive. Matt returns to the office and bumps into Karen. It seems like she's still too afraid to return home. After seeing what other people are willing to do to themselves for something that will destroy Hell's Kitchen, Matt is no longer angry. He's just broken. He realizes that despite his own best efforts, he's become exactly like Stick pushing away his friends to fight his personal war. He finally admits to Karen that he can't fight this fight by himself, and she tells him that he isn't alone. We never were. Meanwhile, Ben returns to the office to write the story on Wilson's childhood murder. However, Mitchell Ellison rejects it, saying that he doesn't have any corroborating sources or hard facts. It's sexy. You sound like a whore. Well, I learned how to be one from you. Oof, sounds like a dad and son arguing right now. But you did tell him to find stories like this, Mitch. It's not sexy. Ben accuses Mitchell of being paid off by Fisk, an idea that was floated by Karen in the previous episode. And that draws the final straw. Mitchell fires Ben. I'm done trying to help you. Dejected, Ben visits his wife, wanting to run away with her. However, Doris recognizes that his story is eating away at him and tells him he has to finish it. Telling the truth is never simple. Or easy. Why only the best of us ever really try? He says he can't because he was fired. You know there's this thing called the internet, right? I mean, for real, Ben, get with the times here, bud. So he returns home to start a blog where he can finally reveal the truth about Fisk and the rampant crime in Hell's Kitchen to whatever searching eyes find it. However, he has an unexpected visitor. Man, I remember when I watched this for the first time. My heart sank into my stomach. 
The more Wilson and Ben talked, the more I held out hope that Ben would make it out alive, but the more I knew he wasn't. Wilson makes the astute observation that people on the internet prefer to seek meaningless entertainment and vicarious living rather than the truths about the societies they live in. Hi, welcome to my channel, like and subscribe. Wilson then brings up his mother, revealing that his contact at the New York Bulletin told him of Ben's visit. This seemingly confirms to Ben that his accusation against Mitchell was correct. Ben protects Karen and takes sole blame for visiting Marlene. Wilson then confirms his suspicion that Ben had nothing to do with Wesley's death. He respects that Ben is a man of conviction and principles, but he cannot forgive involving his mother in a crusade to bring him down. So I am not here to threaten you. I'm here to kill you. Man, I simultaneously love this moment and hate it. This is a great moment of dread that once again showcases the feral nature of Wilson Fisk. This is only the second time we see him personally kill someone, and both men had accidentally involved a woman he cares about in his criminal life, which may also be an explanation as to why he didn't personally kill Matt. If it isn't personal, he ain't gonna kill you himself. Unfortunately for Ben, he did, inviting Wilson's wrath. However, for admittedly personal reasons, I do kind of wish he survived. In the comics, Ben Yurick was a major supporting character for Daredevil and a prominent recurring cast member of Spider-Man, which would have been a neat inroad to bringing in Peter Parker to the greater MCU, or at least what existed as the MCU at that time. It's cool to think about how some of Spider-Man's darker elements could have been brought in tertiarily through Ben, but I'm also aware of how little chance that actually had of happening. But you know, a man can dream, can he? But even in the show, Ben was setting himself up for a good character arc for season two. One of Ben's major story arcs in the first season is his struggle to expose the criminal element within Hell's Kitchen while writing for a dying medium. Even back in 2015, newspapers had become nearly irrelevant, so the remaining companies are desperate to retain customers. In that desperation, editors like Ellison have become extremely stringent about the stories they publish, locking Ben into a situation where his pieces aren't accepted. Or maybe Ellison is on the take. We'll find out soon enough. However, when Ben is fired, he finds a new way to reach the masses, setting him up to be an independent investigator reaching a wider audience than his papers ever could. At least that's what could have happened if not for this. <laughs> and it's a shame too, because I thought he was a good character. My main reason for kinda hating this moment is because I really liked Ben Yurick in the show. Vondi Curtis Hall was superb as this haggard old reporter trying to get by in the modern bureaucratic news structure while still harboring an insatiable hunger for telling the truths of the city. Ben Yurick feels tired and worn down by the many sources who have suffered at the hands of his stories, so it makes sense why he continues to keep Karen away from his investigation. However, she resembles too much of himself at a young age, forcing him to allow her participation. They're both compulsive truth-tellers who cannot stop themselves from pursuing the hidden truths of life. Even when Ben is pissed off at Karen for tricking him, he's still compelled to investigate the Kingpin on his own. As Doris tells him, once he gets a story hooked, he's never gonna give up until he's landed it despite his circumstances. But he was also a good man up until the very end. Despite the wrong Karen committed against him, he's willing to put his journalistic integrity on the line, get fired, and even die himself to protect her. I love the relationship he has with Doris as well. Ben works hard to try to keep her alive, yet he always seems to go to her when he's about to give up on his story. Despite suffering from what I'd assume to be dementia, Doris continues to be his rock, motivating him to seek the truth and spread it. However, his desire to find and expose the truth leads him to die at the hands of Wilson. Well, that and Karen manipulating him. Jeez, I wonder how she's gonna feel about getting yet another person murdered in her fight against Fisk. Well... She's not holding up too well. At Ben's funeral, Karen approaches Doris to take the blame, but Doris eases her guilt by telling her that Ben Yurick was not the type of man to be pushed into pursuing a story, which has been shown throughout the season. She even adds that if Ben and her ever had kids, they'd want them to be exactly like Karen. Man, Doris is such a sweet woman, I love her. 
Lantum gets to catch up with Matt at the funeral as well, and Matt seems to also blame himself for Ben's death. The two guilt-ridden co-workers return to the office where Karen's guilt has now turned to anger. She's pissed off that Foggy didn't bother showing up to the funeral because he apparently had something come up, and she's pissed off that Mitchell Ellison was in attendance. Before his death, Ben had called Karen to tell her that Ellison had fired him after he accused his former boss of being on the take for Fisk, leading her to think the very same thing. However, it's soon revealed that she's expressing her frustration out of fear. She's scared to go home because Fisk may know that she was also involved in Marlene's interview and kill her too. However, Matt promises that he'll keep her safe and that the Kingpin's days are numbered. Speaking of the big guy, he's going over his paperwork that morning, but he notices some irregularities in his numbers. He brings his concerns to Leland, forcing him to admit that he had been skimming money off the top of his accounts in preparation to flee the country. He admits that he and Gao collaborated to poison Vanessa to get him refocused on the mission, but before Wilson can let his anger out, he also reveals that he has Hoffman holed up in an undisclosed location, and if he doesn't call in every 30 minutes, Hoffman will expose everything about Fisk's organization. Well, it looks like he tried to take Gao's words about that wheel to heart. But his preparation failed to take one thing into account. Wilson is a very emotional guy who can't quite control his anger. Well, it looks like the owl could not in fact fly. See, that's a reference to the comics. Please like me, comic book nerds. I'm one of you. I know the comics, I swear. On a serious note, despite my passing familiarity with his comic book counterpart, it sucks to see Leland die without fully becoming that character. However, as he's presented, Leland was great. He was a no-nonsense elitist who seemed to actually believe in Wilson's plan to make the city a better place, or at least the financial benefits that would befall him as a result of it. He was always willing to speak his mind despite the animosity it created between him and his partners. Unfortunately, his loud-mouthedness and prevalent greed led him to his death. He tried to game his way out of Wilson's wrath, but he underestimated his penchant for rage. Look, I love the guy, but this was definitely a fitting death for him. Also interesting note, Leland was originally supposed to survive until the very end of the season where he would be killed by the Punisher in a post credit scene, but it was cut because Netflix has an autoplay feature. Yes, that's as dumb as it sounds. They, they had to rewrite the show because of a function of a streaming service. Anyway, Wilson sends his private police army to find and kill Hoffman, kicking off a city-wide manhunt. Meanwhile, Matt is training at his father's old gym, preparing to interrogate Ellison. Foggy interrupts him to justify his absence from Ben's funeral. Turns out Marcy has in fact agreed to help him by photocopying the files Landman and Zack have on Wilson Fisk and Leland Owlsley, and by handing them over. Foggy wants Matt to go through the law to take Fisk down, and while Matt wants to use his fist to solve the problem, he decides to put his desires aside in order for him and Foggy to move forward together. Which is a nice little moment, a little bit of self-sacrifice in order to save your friendship. The reunited duo visit Brett to give his mother more cancer sticks and eke some information out of him about Ben's murder. Unfortunately, the scene has been wiped clean, including Ben's own fingerprints, which combined with his encounter with the man in the mask has led Brett to doubt the cleanliness of his department. While they talk, Matt overhears Officer Corbin, the cop he beat up in episode 5, receiving some orders to find where Leland is hiding Hoffman. Realizing that Hoffman could be the key to taking down Fisk, Matt buckles down with Foggy and Karen that night to figure out where he's hiding. Using the documents from Landman and Zack, Karen finds a discrepancy in the real estate files from Silver and Brent, the company that employed Leland. One of their properties has disappeared off the count between monthly reports while the overall property value remained unchanged. That missing property is where Hoffman has got to be hiding. Around that same time, Fisk's people also find the location. Is it convenient? Yeah. What? It's convenient, and there's no real way for me to really justify the timing since the police's manhunt happened mostly off screen, so I guess we're just gonna move on here. Also, I noticed while editing that Hoffman received a meatball sub here, which is exactly what he brought Blake the night he killed his partner. Maybe this is a sign of lingering guilt? Or maybe he just really likes meatball subs. I mean, they're pretty good. The police raid Leland's warehouse, killing everyone except for Hoffman thanks to Matt's timely intervention. 
He tells Hoffman to turn himself into Brett and then he'll follow him to the precinct to ensure that he does not run or die. Hoffman makes it there safely and with Nelson and Murdoch as his lawyers, he fesses up to everything. This leads to the complete collapse of the Fisk Empire. Turk is arrested, Corbin and the rest of the corrupt cops are arrested, Senator Cherry, who we also saw at the banquet collaborating with Fisk to pass a zoning law that would give him territory, is arrested as well. Landman of Landman and Zack is also arrested as Marcy watches, happy in her assist with justice. Or maybe just starting an arrest herself, I, I don't know. A little morally dubious still, that one is. Don't let your boy Matt find out about her. Then the FBI comes to the New York Bulletin. The show tries to trick you into thinking that they're there for Ellison, but it's revealed that the Fiskian mole at the Bulletin was actually Caldwell. What? Oh no. Not, not, not her. What, you're, you're asking who she is? Why? She was very prominent the entire season. See, she's there, and there, and, and there. And that- wait, no, I, I already used that shot. In all seriousness, I'm glad that Ellison wasn't the mole. As we've seen throughout the season, despite jumping down Ben's throat and giving him a hard time, Mitchell seemed to really care about him, trying to sort out his insurance and offering him a promotion so that Ben could afford to provide care for Doris. He was a hard man, but a good one. And I'm glad the show didn't corrupt that characterization. Finally, the FBI comes for Wilson. He asks Vanessa to do something for him and then proposes to her as he's dragged away. Meanwhile, our main trio celebrate the downfall of Wilson Fisk and toast to the ones who died for that to happen. Wait a second, there's 25 minutes left in the episode. Oh boy, that doesn't bode well. In the prison car, Wilson starts up a sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm not a religious man. You keep saying that, Wilson, but you've been invoking more scripture than the devout Catholics in this show, so I feel like, I feel like you're doing pretty well for yourself. This speech serves to reveal that Wilson isn't really taking the city's rejection of himself well. He's decided that instead of being the good Samaritan trying to save the city, he's now going to be the man who crippled the Traveler in the first place. The city has rejected him, so now he's going to become the devil they think he is. Suddenly mercenaries who I think were called in by Vanessa attack the FBI and Wilson reveals that his reach is even deep within the feds. I mean that's scary and all, but corrupt feds just sounds like another Tuesday to me. And Wednesday. And Thursday. Basically every day of the week to be honest. Matt sees the breakout on the news and sets out to stop Fisk once and for all. Foggy tries to stop him from putting his life on the line, but Matt asks his friend to trust him, which Foggy does. I think this is the ultimate moment that Matt and Foggy have mended their relationship. Matt gave up on his rageful desires to pursue Fisk through the law, as his friend requested, and now that that approach has failed, Foggy now puts his trust into his friend to do what must be done and come back alive. Matt swings by Melvin's workshop to pick up his new suit and monitors the sounds of the city before honing in on Wilson radioing Vanessa. He has switched trucks and is en route to a helicopter that will take them out of the country, but he tells Vanessa to leave if he doesn't get there in the next 20 minutes. Well, looks like he ain't getting there. You were right. Not everyone deserves a happy ending. I like the new suit. Instead of being tight red spandex, the suit feels more grounded and tactical with the body armor and helmet while still looking recognizable as the original comic book character. It does well to represent the original source material while fitting in with the world and the tone of the show. Matt takes down the guards while Wilson makes a run for it. Dude really needs to work on his running game, holy crap. He may be strong, but dude has a horrible running form. Matt corners him in an alley and we get a nice callback to episode 9. I'm gonna kill you! Take your shot! It's a nice indication of how their roles have been reversed. Before, Matt was recklessly attacking out of anger while Wilson was in control and confident. Now, Wilson is a cornered animal lashing out in anger while Matt is composed and in control. During their climactic fight, it has become clearer and clearer that Wilson has completely given up on his dream, becoming this nihilistic monster. This city! You really think that this will change anything? You think one man in a silly little costume will, will make a difference? That sounds crazy coming from the guy who sought to save the city all season. 
But to me, this cast an even more tragic light on Wilson's story arc. He wanted to be the savior of Hell's Kitchen, but Hell's Kitchen rejected him, so now he's content to just be the devil. Matt ain't sympathizing, though. <laughs> Brett arrives on the scene and allows Matt to escape. What am I supposed to call you when I file my report? So I guess Brett takes it upon himself to give the man in the mask a new name. Daredevil? Sounds like he's gonna jump Snake River Canyon on his rocket cycle. <laughs> Look, it's a silly name if you really think about it, but I'm glad the show only pokes fun at it, but doesn't go overboard on making it a massive joke. It feels like a realistic reaction the populace would have. The Nelson and Murdoch plaque is officially hanged. Hung? Hung? hung hungest? They put it on the wall. The gang's together for good, but Foggy has to run off to help Marcy get a new job since she got fired for helping get her boss arrested. And he indicates that they're getting back together. I guess we're forgetting about the three or four episodes that set up the Foggy-Karen relationship then, huh? Are we trying to set up like a, a Mad and Karen thing since Claire's out of the picture? I don't know, I guess we'll have to keep watching. All I do know is that Matt again promises that despite the hardships and traumatic events they've been through, the trio will move forward together. The season ends with Wilson sitting down in his cell and being taunted by yet another white wall, and Matt setting out with his new identity, Daredevil. This is a good note to end on. Our main protagonist has evolved and changed, adopting a new identity to reflect that while our main antagonist has returned to a site he thought he escaped, indicating that he has become the very thing he wanted to avoid, his father. If it isn't clear already, I absolutely love season one of Daredevil. Is it perfect? <laughs> of course not. You got Rance, the gunless goon, the way Foggy and Karen's romantic coupling is set up and swiftly forgotten about once Foggy anger bangs Marcy, the unexplained black sky thing, some awkward editing around certain fight scenes, the occasional obvious stunt doubles, Wesley dying like a complete Muppet, and some others. However, all of those criticisms for me are outweighed by the excellent character work within a mostly tightly written story. Matt is a fantastic protagonist. Charlie Cox does a great job in the role. It's hard to accurately pretend to be a blind person, and though I'm no expert in discerning that, I think Cox does a fantastic job at portraying it from the unfocused look in his eyes, which is really hard to be consistent with, trust me, I was just trying to do it in the mirror, to the subtle ways he feels around the spaces he's in. Matt is also just a really well-written character. Thanks to being tortured by the sounds of an oppressed city as a kid, he's developed a strong desire to fix Hell's Kitchen by using the ninja skills he learned. He faces a man similar to himself, causing a crisis of conscience. He has always strove to reject Stick's training, yet he finds himself following his commands as he fights Fisk. He doesn't want to push the people he loves away like Stick did to him, yet he finds himself alone as his lies create a wider divide between him and Foggy and Karen. It becomes clear that the devil within him is a combination of his simmering rage and his desire not to become the man he came to view as a father. What he needs to become in order to save Hell's Kitchen is this painting. Yes, I'm being serious. The color of anger, of rage, but also the color of the heart, of love, hope. This strikes the perfect balance between the two. Matt is an angry guy, as we see over and over through the show, but he lets his rage take control of him far too often. Stick rightly points this out in his training sessions. Anger is a spark. Good. Rage is a wildfire. Matt needs to learn to use his anger as a spark for inspiring hope. He's pissed off at the injustice and the fear in his city, but he lets that anger control him too often. When he tries to break his only rule in anger and utterly fails, this forces him to dial it back and figure out how to use his anger for good. He does this by becoming Daredevil. His superhero identity is a result of his rage, but is also a symbol of hope for the people of Hell's Kitchen. He was able to fight back against evil not as a feared mystery vigilante, but as a superhero. But not just a superhero, but a superhero that is backed by the citizens of the city. He learns that he can't stand alone and that he needs people to support him. I also started to see many similarities between him and Ben Yurik as the show went on. Both are men who have been beaten down by their city yet continue to fight for it trying to find truth and justice. 
They try their best to keep their loved ones away from their mission, while also struggling with whether or not their mission is even worth it. They even put their lives on the line fighting for what they believe will save their city, and in Ben's case, he actually loses it. There's also another character Matt is pretty similar to, the main antagonist, Wilson Fisk. Like, they are eerily similar. Both grew up in Hell's Kitchen and moved away for a bit before returning with a mission to save their hometown. Both struggle with their anger, both live in fear of becoming the men that raised them while slowly becoming more and more like them, but they are able to find someone who brings them back from the brink. However, while Matt is able to overcome his issues, Wilson isn't. Matt learns to manage his anger to find a balance between it and hope while Wilson's anger continues to go unchecked. What was it you said before, Wilson? Emotion can turn the most circumspect of men careless. That it does, Fisk. That it does. Wilson recklessly kills Anatoly out of anger, and while he's able to recover from it in the short term, this planted a seed of doubt in his remaining allies, leading them to turn against him one by one. This ends up leaving him completely alone. Matt learns to let people in and leans on his friends for help, but it seems like Wilson insists on doing things on his own. The Rangskahovs were necessary tools for his plan, Nobu was a necessary evil to accomplish… something. To be honest, I'm just now realizing that it was never really explained what Nobu's organization brought to Wilson's group. Like, Wesley brings that question up, and Fisk just goes, oh yeah, necessary evil, I guess. Yeah, but like, what does he do? Nobu doesn't produce income, he doesn't provide services for the other members of the group, he's just… there. Anyway, Leland and Gao seemed to be his friends, but they turned against him for straying from his mission. Wesley was his closest friend, but he's killed, causing Wilson to become even more emotional. He even tries to distance himself from Vanessa when she's attacked, even though she doesn't want to. If you parallel this scene with Matt's conversation with Karen later in the same episode, you see exactly why Wilson lost. Matt is broken by his desire to help people, even those who don't want to be helped, so he turns to Karen and confides in her. He lets her in, while Wilson is so racked with guilt that he sends Vanessa out of the country. She protests this, but he overrides it. He may love Vanessa, but he still insists on going at it alone, which ultimately leads to his downfall. This is also what makes the Kingpin's character arc so unique for a television antagonist. When I think of your typical television villain arc, I usually think of characters who are already all-powerful at the beginning of the season and maintain that throughout, or who gain power as they progress through their arc as a villain. But with Fisk, he loses power throughout the season. He's at his peak at the very beginning of the season before he's even physically introduced. His introduction into the show is also his introduction to Vanessa, the woman who will save him from becoming his father, but will also doom him to fail his mission. In a way, once he loses that air of mystery to the audience, he also begins to lose it to the characters within the show, starting his downward spiral of power. As the season goes forward, his allies one by one turn against him, and he has to weed them out until he's the lone man at the top of his organization, all alone save for the woman he loves. And I guess Francis is there too. That dude earns his paycheck. That's the kind of employee you want as a boss. You punch him in the face and the dude's still willing to help your wife flee the country. Wilson's fight to maintain his organization and proceed with his mission makes him feel more human even though he's a monster. It's honestly one of my favorite villain arcs on television. Karen and Foggy work great as supporting characters. Karen reflects Matt and a younger Ben in her relentless pursuit of justice. Unlike them, she readily embraces the help of others, mostly out of necessity, and this leads to dire consequences. Daniel Fisher dies as a result of her asking questions. She's framed for his murder and is nearly epstein with a follow-up murder attempt from Rance. She's jumped by thugs. Mrs. Cardenas is killed as a result of Karen's battle against Fisk's relocation efforts. She's kidnapped by Wesley and then she kills him. She's tormented by nightmares of Fisk killing her in retribution. And finally, Ben dies in her stead for the Marlene visit. All of these traumatic events weigh down on her and yet she presses on on, determined to bring Fisk to justice. She can border on unlikable at times, but I can always appreciate a character who goes through the ringer and still keeps fighting. 
Foggy, on the other hand, starts out the show as some typical comedic relief. He's very charismatic and likable, lifting up the people around him. However, as the show goes on, Foggy starts to spiral down a hole of cynicism. Elena Cardenas is killed for rallying a protest against Fisk's buyout at Foggy's encouragement, and then he immediately finds out that his best friend has been lying to him the entire time they've known each other. Despite his world being absolutely destroyed, he still presses on to pursue justice. He's even able to inspire a change within Marcy, who was previously established to be a classic Mean Girl trope. While he never quite recovers from his world shattering, Foggy is able to place his trust in Matt once again and join a pact with his partners to move forward together. For Foggy, the mission to help the city comes first. The rest of the cast is peppered with many well-defined characters as well. Just about every supporting and even minor character has established character traits and goals that fill out the cast nicely. For the most part. I've already talked about many of them briefly, but there's still many more who are also well done within the show. Vanessa is a supportive girlfriend who provides stability and comfort for Wilson. Melvin is a mentally disabled inventor forced to work for Fisk to protect the woman he loves. Blake is a hot-headed and brazen corrupt detective, which creates a nice dynamic with his more quiet and cowardly partner. You have Fisher's widow whose main priority in the aftermath of her husband's death is to protect her kids from the very thing she forced Daniel into. I mean, even Marcy gets a tiny character arc. The cast, from the main players to the guest appearances, is very strong, which serves to create a Hell's Kitchen that feels real and lived in. In fact, it feels like its own character. Wesley was not inaccurate in how he described it. Hell's Kitchen is a dump, full of criminals and scumbags who are looking to screw over anyone around them to get ahead. It tests the bond of brotherhood and friendship. Many are tested, but most of the time, death drives them apart. The city punishes those who desire to stand up for what's right while allowing evil to thrive. Hell, you can't even get a good gun around these parts. It's full of citizens who possess fear of those in control or just general apathy to the criminal elite who perpetuate the crime that terrorizes them to line their own pockets and gain even more control. I'm gonna try really hard here not to make a reference to today's society. However, that's not to say there isn't light within the city's darkness. Josie's bar is a retreat to come together for the community. Matt and Foggy are avocados at law fighting to help those in need within the legal system. Brett is a clean cop trying to clean up the streets the best he can. There's an entire hospital that strives to help anyone they can with staff that go above and beyond for their patients. There are men like Ben Yurick and women like Karen Page who still seek to expose the truth. Mitchell Ellison is an employer who tries to help his employees when they need it. There are still God-fearing people out there who are willing to stand up for their homes. Harkening back to Foggy's conversation with Karen in episode 2, yes, Hell's Kitchen may be a hive of scum and villainy, but there's still good things in the muck. I think this is best represented by this guy. Yes, this random guy right here. That's Tom Belkin. He's the road captain in the Kitchen Hellions. He organizes the food drive every Thanksgiving. Bikers don't have the best reputation thanks to shows like Sons of Anarchy and Mayans MC, and the many, 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 many MCs that have engaged in violent conflicts over the years. Yet this gruff and hardened criminal still makes time to make sure the kids are fed. Despite its awful exterior, Hell's Kitchen is still a community. And that feeds into another reason why I love this series so much. Daredevil is known for being a superhero show, an MCU show no less, that really leans into its TVMA rating. People are brutally murdered with car doors and bowling balls. Women are trafficked. Children are killed, albeit off-screen, and kidnapped. And it gets pretty horny at times. And for the really down bad out there, you can even catch a side boob or two. And yes, it is very gritty and grimy with some very dark imagery and themes in it, but despite that darkness, there is still hope that seeps through the cracks. Matt's crusade inspires people to stand up against overwhelming odds against them, and that's what allows him to win. Fisk held all the cards in his favor at the beginning of the season, yet he failed to understand what I just talked about. 
Not, not the side boob thing, but the other thing. Despite sharing a mission with Matt to save Hell's Kitchen, Wilson shares the same views as Wesley about the city. He views it as completely lost. That's why he's willing to completely burn it down and sacrifice innocent lives for the sake of his mission. When the city rejected him and he gave up on that mission, I think Wilson's true thoughts were revealed. You deserve a better tomorrow! You deserve to drown! However, Matt obviously disagrees. He actually knows citizens in the city who are worth saving. He believes in the good of the city. That's why he wants to save it. Wilson criticizes Matt's mission with some ironic words. You think one man in a silly little costume will, will make a difference? In any other project, this would be the most generic thing for a villain to say to a hero in their final confrontation, but here it speaks to another reason why Wilson's view of the city caused him to lose. He tried to be a lone man to make a difference. Yes, he surrounded himself with allies, but they were always there to be chess pieces for him. He was always planning on getting rid of the Chechnins. Blake was only around as long as he was useful. Nobu and his organization were a means to an end that were dealt with when they got difficult. The only people he actually viewed as equals in his mission were Gao, maybe Leland, Wesley, and Vanessa. Gao abandoned him, Leland betrayed him, Wesley was swallowed up by the city, and his precious Vanessa was basically forced out of it. In the end, because he only used the city's worst to burn it down, he was left alone. However, Matt starts to bring in allies who represent the best of the city. While he initially tries to push them away, he eventually lets them in and thanks to their help, Matt is able to save the city from Wilson. Claire was always there to stitch him up. Karen would always relentlessly motivate him to find the truth. Ben provided him with needed intel. Foggy lended him his trust. Melvin gave him armor. Even Vladimir gave his life for Matt's mission. The city stood with Matt and rejected Fisk, and I think that's the message Daredevil Season 1 promotes. The entire idea of a fearful, apathetic city turning against the man who sought to oppress them by himself and instead uniting behind Matt is echoed in the Thurgood Marshall quote Matt reads a few times in the season. Oh shit, not Marshall. There's a price to be paid for division and isolation. Democracy cannot flourish amid hate. Justice cannot take root amid rage. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must descend from the fear. Yes, we live in a dark society with shadowy figures who seem to hold a daunting level of control to oppose. There are corrupt cops, politicians, journalists, federal agents, etc. who will punish those who would stand against them. Yes, one man can't make all the difference, but one man can inspire others to fight back and enact real change within society. All it takes is one man to make a stand against corruption, against crime, against the darkness. All it takes is one man without fear. Well, because of how long this video is and the fact that the Marvel Netflix shows are so interconnected that I'd have to combine them all into a singular retrospective which would take literal years, I'm going to end the retrospective here so I can keep my upload rate at least somewhat consistent. So, uh, yeah, stay blessed. Thanks for watching. See you next time for the Jessica Jones Season 1 video. And, uh, yeah, I hope you had a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, here's to 2024.